casualties, we mourn the loss of Constable Heidi Stevenson, a 23-year veteran of the RCMP who died in the line of duty during these tragic events. We stand in solidarity with the residents of Nova Scotia as they mourn and deal with this tragedy. And I'd like everyone uh, who is able to, to please stand uh, for a moment of silence in honour of these victims. Merci. Thank you. Roll call, please, Madam Deputy Clerk. Councillor Luloff. <coughs> Councillor Dudas. Present. Councillor Harder. Here. Councillor Suds. Here. Councillor El Shantiri. On the phone. Councillor Gower. EC. Councillor Cavanaugh. Present. Councillor Shirelli. Councillor Egli. Here. Councillor Deans. Councillor Tierney. Present. Councillor Fleury. EC. Councillor King. Here. Councillor McKenney. Present. Councillor Leeper. Present. Councillor Brockington. Here. Councillor Menard. Here. Conseil Cloutier. Present. Councillor DeRouze. Here. Councillor Moffat. Here. Councillor Meehan. Present. Councillor Hubley. Here. Mayor Watson. You see. You have a quorum, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have the same procedures for the teleconference meeting as, uh, as last time, so I think you all have a copy of that, so no need to go over that. Confirmation of minutes, adoption de process verbo for the meeting of the 8th of April, 2020. Carried. Okay. Any, any dissents? Uh, declaration of interest, including those originally arising from prior meetings. Declaration de conflit d'intérêt. Are there any declarations? None. Communications as presented. Regrets. Councillor Deans uh, and Councillor Shirelli advised they'd be absent from the City Council meeting of the 22nd of April, 2020. A motion to introduce reports. Motion portant présentation de rapport. Councillor Moffat, seconded by Councillor Dudas, please. That plan committee report 22 and the reports from the city clerk entitled Ward 19 Cumberland Vacancy Options, including the revised oral implication section and summary of oral and written submissions for items subject to the Planning Act explanation requirement at City Council meeting of April 8, 2020, be received and considered. How's your dog, Scott? That was not my dog. <laughs> that was someone else's dog. Um, so on the uh, motion by Councillor Moffat, carried. Any dissents? Well, good morning, uh, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen who are watching on uh, uh, Ottawa.ca or Rogers Community 22, au Cable 23. I'll bring you a brief update on uh, our, the situation with respect to COVID-19. On Monday, Chair Suds and I were pleased to bring some good news for our city, particularly for our most vulnerable residents, during an update on the good work being done by our Human Needs Task Force. The province of Ontario recently announced that it is providing funding to municipalities and community organizations through the Social Services Relief Fund in order to support them in their response to COVID-19. Through the Provincial Community Homelessness Prevention Initiative, the City has now received $6.6 .6 million of a $13.3 million commitment. The City also received $4.8 million in funding through the Federal Government's Reaching Home Program, announced in late March. 
In total, we've received $11.4 million from our provincial and federal partners to help improve the capacity of the homelessness service providers and other non-profit agencies to service clients immediately. $8.4 million of this funding will be allocated to the existing shelter system and the most pressing homeless needs, homelessness needs, including isolation centres, day services and shelter services. In addition to the Routier Community Centre, this funding will help us immobilize the Jim Durrell Recreation Centre on Walkley Road to assist up to 140 men in the shelter system practice physical distancing starting on Monday. Le Patro d'Ottawa in Coburg and Lower Town will also become a 40-bed isolation centre for residents in service homes, while the McNabb Arena in Centre Town will open its showers and washrooms to the homeless this week. The remaining $3 million of the funding will be allocated to non-profit community organizations to address their immediate and ongoing needs. These agencies must focus specifically on serving individuals and families who are at risk or, uh, of or currently experiencing homelessness or provide essential services and supports to other at-risk residents and equity-seeking communities during the COVID-19 crisis. I want to remind, include a reminder today that we are inviting local non-profit agencies to apply for this funding. The application process for the funding opened on Monday and forms are currently available on ottawa.ca. I'd like to invite the non-profit organization and others to apply for this funding at ottawa.ca. Applications will be end of Monday, end of day on Monday, April 27th, and I encourage eligible organizations and agencies to apply. My thanks to the province of Ontario and the government of Canada for their support, which is enabling us to support the residents in our community facing the greatest challenges during this pandemic. I also want to thank our Human Needs Task Force under the leadership of Chair Suds and Donna Gray for their hard work and dedication to helping our city's most vulnerable residents during this particularly difficult time. I want to turn my attention now to the population survey that was recently conducted by OPH. The survey gauged Ottawa residents' preparedness in response to COVID-19 and the respect of social distancing measures since they were put in place and the results are promising. The survey showed that 94% of respondents believe that the pandemic is a serious issue and that 84% of people had changed their social behaviour in response to COVID-19. They're taking the crisis very seriously and are doing the necessary, uh, what's necessary to fight this pandemic. ...and loved ones or by socialising during appropriately distanced walks in their yard uh, or in their yard while maintaining the appropriate distance from others. In addition, only 5% of the people in Ottawa report socialising in their home or in the homes of friends and family. I want to thank residents for adhering to the advice of the Ottawa Public Health Bureau, as well as provincial and federal officials, to help stop the spread of COVID-19. The actions we are all uh, taking are critical. Ces gestes uh, font toute la différence dans notre lutte contre... That would make a big difference in our fight against the pandemic. ...and avoid going out, and the more we will help stop the virus from spreading within our community. And my sincere thanks to all of you for doing your part. And speaking of people doing their part, it's wonderful to see so many individuals and businesses across our city continuing to step up to make a difference in this fight. I spoke about some great examples at our last council meeting, and I want to once again highlight a couple more today. It's stories like that of resident uh, Jordan Harden, who started handsan.ca. Mr. Harding is an executive at a local tech company. He's still busy with his day job, but in his spare time, he's bottling and distributing hand sanitizer for free to people who are most at risk of getting COVID-19. Mr. Harding is working with Dale Hammond, who oversees the operation of the Vast Delivery Network, and they've received the generous support of North of Seven Distillery, Ottawa Scene, and WTF Lab, as well as a number of local businesses and residents. I want to thank Jordan and his team for the exceptional work that they're doing to help protect healthcare professionals, older adults, first responders, and grocery and restaurant staff in our community. I also want to highlight the work of the Shielding Heroes campaign. The campaign started after Dr. Anna Teresa Lobos from CHEO made an appeal about the urgent need for PPE or personal protective equipment for frontline healthcare workers. This led, to the local business, this led rather to local business leader Darcy Walsh, an executive with Edelman Canada's Ottawa office, reaching out to former NHLer Brendan Bell, Danielle Robinson at the Ottawa Senators Foundation, and HP Canada's President and CEO Mary Ann Ewell. 
Working together, the team developed a Made in Ontario innovative sh face shield that received approval from Health Canada. The Shielding Heroes campaign, which is being led by the Ottawa Senators Foundation, is looking to raise $500,000 to ensure that 3,500 medical grade face shields can be manufactured and shipped every week over the next 12 weeks to, region, to hospitals throughout the National Capital Region. Since launching the campaign last week, more than $260,000 has been raised with the help of many local companies and foundations, and I'm very grateful to all those who have generously supported this effort. More funds will be required in the weeks to come to help protect our outstanding health professionals who are putting their lives on the line to keep us all health, healthy and safe. I invite residents and businesses interested in contributing to the Shielding Heroes campaign to visit SendsFoundation.com for information on how you can help in this important effort. This is yet another example of how our community and our residents are stepping up to get us through this challenging time together. As our community continues to do, uh, to do everything it can to fight the spread of this virus, I want to tip my hat to our city team. Thank you, Steve Kanalakis, Dr. Etches, to our general managers, and to every single employee that is involved in these efforts to protect and support our residents during this difficult time. I know you are putting in countless hours to assess the situation as it evolves and to plan our response in collaboration with our multiple community partners. It's a significant task at hand, but know that all of City Council has been impressed with your dedication and professionalism over the last few weeks. A big thanks to the team for their outstanding work in the past few weeks. Thank you so much. Now we're going to have uh, verbal updates uh, by uh, Public Health in the City of Ottawa and we'll go through all of the presentations first and then we'll go uh, back to our, um, our list of councillors and ask each member of council if they have any questions or comments on anything that Dr. Etches uh, or Steve Kanalakis or Donna Gray or Wendy Stevenson have uh, given us. Alors on va commencer avec uh, le Président, le Conseil de So we'll start with uh, the board chair of the uh, Health Council, Councillor Eglai. As a brief update before Dr. Etches shares more information with you, I'd like to highlight a few initiatives undertaken by the team at Ottawa Public Health. As you and all residents well know, information and guidance around COVID-19 pandemic seems to be changing and evolving at an incredible pace, which amplifies the challenge of keeping residents informed. Ottawa Public Health uses various channels to keep residents, businesses, community uh, serving, uh, service organizations and elected officials informed of the latest guidance. With the city as vast and diverse as Ottawa, this is no easy task. Ottawa Public Health staff have been keeping the website ottawapublichealth.ca slash coronavirus up to date while continuing to develop new content that helps communicate how to best reduce the transmission of COVID-19. It's also critically important that we ensure this information reaches diverse audiences who may not use or have access to our mainstream communication. That is why OPH staff are working closely sorry, with the representatives. Uh, Keith, Keith, sorry. Someone is uh, yes. madly typing away. Please put your phone on mute. Thank you. Merci. Go ahead, Keith. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, that is why OPH staff are working closely with representatives from groups like Refugee 613, the City of Ottawa Aboriginal Working Group, Together We Can, the Somerset West Community Health Centre, and others to collaborate and ensure we are using the right channels and the right approaches to get information to those in need. This includes launching a website with COVID-19 information available in over 30 languages. Last night, the Ottawa Board of Health, with the support of OPH staff, or not last night, rather, but Monday night, sorry, the Ottawa Board of Health, with the support of OPH staff, passed a motion calling on the provincial government to amend the emergency orders to allow for the safe operation of outdoor allotment gardens and community gardens. Seems kind of funny on a day when we're the coldest capital in the, in the world, but uh, spring is coming. And we know these gardens are an important source of nutritious and affordable food for our community. And with appropriate guidance from public health, we believe they can operate safely. Councillor Brockington is bringing forward a motion today, which I am seconding, to seek a similar endorsement on behalf of City Council. I hope my colleagues will join me in supporting these efforts. On another note, as we turn our minds to what the future holds, including ultimately relaxing some of the current physical distancing measures in place, Ottawa Public Health 
is working with various City of Ottawa partners to develop a strategy to make sense for the health and well-being of our community. The strategy involves bringing together the perspectives of residents, local businesses, and councillors to help determine the path forward. I anticipate sharing more details on this engagement opportunity with my council colleagues in the short term. As always, I would like to thank our entire team at OPH and all the city employees for the dedication and hard work during these trying times. And I echo uh, your sentiment, Mr. Mayor, in helping and, and thanking rather all of our residents who have come together and are, are working together to follow the social and physical distancing rules to contribute to various charities and volunteer organizations. We're going to get through this together. And I, again, thank you to all the residents of Ottawa. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Etches. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Good morning. Bonjour. Quay. I have some slides uh, that I, I've given to Council, and I believe that they are also going to be projected. So um, just to, to say then uh, that I'm starting uh, with slide number two, which is called Our Approach to the Pandemic. We are taking the same framework that we need to bring the disease under control that we have our non-pharmaceutical interventions, which include the physical distancing, that are playing a key role. Uh, we know that uh, along with that, we need to support our community in various ways. I'm happy to answer any questions about operational aspects of our response, uh, though that was more covered in detail with our Board of Health. And I will discuss uh, the plan looking forward and, and how uh, we're working in collaboration with others. So going on to the third slide, uh, I am happy to say that we have expanded testing capacity in our region. We are up to being able to do 1,000 tests a day. Uh, and this comes along with um, the ability to prioritize more groups. So our website and the slide highlight that the number of uh, priority groups that can be accommodated uh, has grown. Uh, we encourage people to check uh, the website if they have any uh, symptoms of illness that could be related to COVID-19 to present to be tested, um, or if they need support because they can't leave their home very easily, um, you know, that this is something that we have other systems to facilitate testing um, and they can reach out. Uh, I will say that as we um, continue to try to uh, test as many people as possible, uh, we have to continuously uh, calibrate um, what, uh, what we're doing uh, because there are other pressures for testing that are coming from long-term care homes and retirement homes, and so it's a delicate balance. Uh, but we continue to ask people if they are um, in one of the priority groups to present for testing. So I'm going on to slide four. Uh, speaking of all the testing, and we usually, you know, daily we report on the number of positives that we've seen out of those tests. I can tell you that we're up to uh, 899 positive tests, and people are wondering, um, have we peaked? Will we peak? When, when will we know? And so this slide uh, is about hospitalizations and intensive care unit trends because that is a more reliable picture um, of what's happening in our community with the rate of infection. A certain proportion of people will always get uh, more severe illness, unfortunately, and present to the hospital. And the good news here is that we do see that the hospitalizations have been stable. Um, to the eye, it looks like there's a decline recently, and that's good. Um, my, my epidemiologists tell me we're, we can't say it's statistically significant yet, uh, but this, this is the kind of information that we'll, we'll be able to say we've peaked when we see uh, the hospitalizations decrease, uh, and certainly over an incubation period of two weeks will be very um, you know, reassuring data. Uh, hospitalizations do lag uh, about a week or so from the, the lab confirmed results and so this picture is very similar to the picture across the province of Ontario uh, where the Premier was talking uh, about having seen the infections peak. So that, uh, that's the general population testing. On the next slide, slide five, of course, there's a different picture I want to highlight that's very important in our long-term care homes. 
And so this slide shows of all the long-term care homes, uh, we've now had, uh, you know, a 25 to 30 percent or so uh, have had an outbreak. Some of them have resolved their outbreaks. I believe we have four outbreaks in long-term care homes that have been resolved, and there are uh, others ongoing. Um, this is a population that's more vulnerable. Of the 25 deaths that we've seen due to COVID-19 in our community so far, 16 of those have been related to outbreaks in long-term care homes or retirement homes. And so I, um, I do have a second slide that shows the retirement home uh, on slide six environment is um, not seen the same uh, increase, uh, in, you know, in terms of the percentage of homes affected. Uh, in both cases, it is the majority of homes that have managed to prevent spread of infection. And I want to commend uh, the teams uh, of long-term care home um, owners, operators, staff that are working hard to, to continue to try to prevent outbreaks and then control them. On the next slide, seven, uh, I will speak to the fact that this is a big undertaking and it's hard for long-term care homes to do it on their own when they have staff that have to be off because they're ill and other um, pressures. And so uh, the province's provincial action plan is accelerating the measures to support long-term care homes. They are fast-tracking efforts, uh, working with Public Health Ontario, Ontario hospitals, public health units to really support long-term care homes and retirement homes with aggressive testing, screening and surveillance, um, managing the outbreaks and the spread of the disease, growing the long-term care home workforce, and ensuring that critical supplies, including personal um, protective equipment, is available for all staff. And so locally, what this means is that um, we are seeing excellent collaboration uh, with the hospitals across the region, with other healthcare providers who are working together to um, you know, contact homes, uh, offer specific support. Uh, this has been happening over the weekend uh, for four uh, care homes for Carling View Manor, Madonna Long-Term Care Home, Laurier Manor, uh, the Mall 4 Long-Term Care Home. Um, people have received support with staffing and personal protective equipment, and we're going from there. Uh, so the idea is um, that long-term care homes are in the highest need uh, due to the nature of the populations they serve. Uh, you can imagine um, uh, where there's a floor of people who are living with dementia that it is very hard to self-isolate people in a humane way. And so um, this is the focus uh, to protect those most vulnerable and we're moving out from there, uh, going on to support long uh, retirement homes, uh, also other settings where there's congregate living, like group homes, shelters, rooming houses. Ottawa Public Health has been involved in providing guidance to all of these settings and will continue to do so. On the next slide, uh, slide eight, uh, I'm talking about uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. So the physical distancing is, is still critical to maintain. People have definitely uh, and rightly so turned to think about how we can um, relax some restrictions safely. We need to plan very carefully for that, uh, but it is not the time yet to actually implement those plans. We need to be very careful because most of the population has not been exposed to COVID-19. Most of the population is not immune. And so uh, anything that increases our interactions with others can increase transmission of the virus again, you know, potentially undoing the work, the hard work that everyone in Ottawa has accomplished so far. And so we're going to be very careful about um, that plan. The uh, discussion at the Board of Health on Monday did include uh, the importance of an additional layer of protection for others if people can, um, are wearing uh, non-medical masks, face coverings uh, when they're out and they can't maintain a two-meter distance from others. Uh, and we've heard that people are having trouble accessing that supply. We would like everyone in Ottawa to be able to access uh, these non-medical masks. And so that is an initiative that we're continuing to promote um, donations to COVID donations at toh.ca. That's COVID donations at toh.ca. If people have masks they've made and they'd like to donate or you know different ideas, please be in touch. Um, 
this, this uh, is in the context, of course, of recognizing that our healthcare workers need medical masks. And so uh, we still need to prioritize healthcare workers using the medical mask. Uh, turning to slide nine, uh, when it comes to supporting the community, uh, we know that uh, people are finding the physical distancing challenging, and so we are uh, con continuing to work with mental health partners and promote, uh, you know, with, um, with a dedicated uh, kind of uh, site on our website that pulls all of the resources together, the supports that are available to people. Um, there are, of course, if people are in crisis, the distress uh, center, but many other virtual supports that our healthcare partners are, are now providing. And um, one that definitely is worth highlighting is, is a chat or text service uh, for women who may be concerned that they're in an unsafe environment. Uh, likewise, children are a priority. Uh, we're concerned and we're working with school boards, with CHEO, with the Children's Aid Society um, to to be able to proactively reach out to families where we think um, there are some signs or concerns um, that they may need more support. Uh, I will highlight uh, on, on this slide that substance use also uh, is, is uh, an issue that could um, impact uh, the health of the population right now. As people are reporting uh, in surveys done by the um, Canadian Centre for Substance Use and Addictions that the um, the amount of alcohol they're consuming has increased, and, and that is, uh, of course, um, potentially linked to, to more concerning uh, behaviors, and um, we know that we're, we're just, it's worthwhile asking people to monitor their intake um, and to think about what else uh, can be done to cope with stress, uh, and, and potentially, um, you know, that is something that uh, if people do want more support on, if they're finding they're getting into trouble with that consumption, um, that there are also services available. I would encourage people to continue going to our website because we, we are, are always building new resources for specific populations, uh, the chair mentioned in many languages, uh, but also, you know, dedicated for businesses, dedicated for uh, workplaces. All, all of these, these audiences are important older adults uh, as well as youth. So I'll turn to slide 10, uh, which is about looking ahead. And I, I want um, to spend a little bit of time uh, actually uh, going through um, something a bit more t um, on, on the testing uh, of COVID-19 uh, because there are a lot of questions um, about the kinds of tests that are available and, and can we can we use something that would tell who's immune or who's not? And um, you know, what about these point of care tests? So, um, in addition to the testing that's being done now to detect the virus, uh, an important surveillance system um, tool would be to test people for antibodies against the COVID-19 virus. And that would show who's been infected. And, and if you have the antibodies, you're likely immune. We don't know for sure uh, if you are completely or for how long. Uh, but this is a piece of work that the province is organizing to be able to have that picture across the province. Uh, it's important because we need to be able to monitor the level of infection in the community as we talk about relaxing restrictions. The goals of testing for COVID-19 change over the course of a pandemic. To begin with, the tests that we used were for diagnosing someone with an infection and they were to detect early cases, um, to detect you know, um, the transmission, the entry of the virus into our community. We focused on travelers. And then we added a focus on identifying uh, cases in high-risk settings, in hospitals, in long-term care, in healthcare workers, uh, for people who needed to be back at work. For the rest of the population, we've relied on self-isolation and physical distancing to keep people with COVID-19 infections in the general population from passing them on, so with, you know, without a need for a diagnosis. Ideally, we'll keep increasing the testing capacity to be able to find the COVID-19 cases in the general population and then use our case and contact management um, as effectively as possible to prevent transmission in a more targeted way. But keeping the rate of transmission low will continue to require some measures of physical distancing. So as mentioned, the next type of test to be available is a serology test for antibodies. It will be less useful for diagnosis because uh, it takes 
a few days to a week for antibody levels to become detectable once someone's infected. So the virus detection test shows if someone's infected sooner. And when people speak about the point of care or rapid COVID-19 tests, they're often referring to these serology tests. The point of care tests that detect the virus are also being developed. And none of these tests yet are available in Ontario to the point of being a, a useful intervention tool. Most of them are still being validated. In some cases, countries have had to cancel their rapid testing programs because of false negative rates being too high. So apart from having the surveillance and the testing capacity, the way we're looking at approaching uh, a relaxation of restrictions is that there are certain criteria, certain things that need to be in place that would give us uh, confidence that we could do this more safely. The disease transmission needs to be under control. And so I mentioned, we're following the hospitalizations. We're looking at decreases um, in that as a sign that there's decrease in infection in our community. We need our healthcare systems to be able to detect and test and treat everyone uh, and that hot spots are minimized in vulnerable populations, so long-term care homes, retirement homes, group homes. We need to know that schools and workplaces and others that are, are going to recommence some activity have established preventive measures and are looking at doing things in a new way that prevents more transmission from happening in those settings. We need to keep an eye on the measures to stop new cases from being imported. Uh, so to think about travel and how we can manage any importation of cases. And the community needs to be engaged. We need to have uh, a good engagement and conversation with community, with, with, through counselors, with counselors, with community agencies, with different populations, uh, old, young, businesses, private sector, all of this, to be able to understand collectively what precautions we need to take, uh, what the priorities are, and how we learn to live under a new normal. So I will uh, you know, be happy to answer any further questions about that. This is uh, clearly a piece of work that involves federal, provincial, and local level governments. And the community engagement strategy that we'll be undertaking will be done with the City of Ottawa, as there are many different um, aspects uh, to consider together. Uh, also, just for, for those who may have it at the, the, in their minds, uh, we are working with the public health uh, colleagues that we have across the river in Gatineau, and we understand they're taking direction from their province about how to relax restrictions safely, and so we'll be coordinating uh, and communicating as much as possible, knowing that our population is very much connected. So I want to end uh, on slide 11. I'm going to end by thanking everyone for their continued dedication to supporting others during this pandemic. I'm very impressed and inspired by the way people are caring for each other. Uh, and I thank you, uh, everybody, for doing their part to keep the transmission of COVID-19 in our community under control. Thank you very much. Merci. Great. And thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for your leadership uh, as well and, and that of your colleagues. So now over to uh, City Manager Steve Kanalakis for um, COVID and um, flooding update. Mr. Kanalakis. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the um, slides aren't up on the screen, so I don't know if people can see them. So I'm going to uh, be a little bit more meticulous in terms of uh, going through my slides for the benefit of the people that uh, may not have them uh, from the viewing public. Um, thank you very much. I want to start by... Um, thanking uh, all city staff who are um, continuing to rise to the challenge to meet um, all of our service demands that we have and to plan for the future. Uh, plus, they're dealing with their own individual situations, whether they're working from home or having to come into work. Um, everyone has a unique story to tell, and I'm just so uh, uh, impressed um, with their commitment uh, to still continuing uh, to deliver services that our residents depend on. So huge thank you uh, to them. Uh, before I start. One of the, uh, the presentation today is a little different than the one I gave last time in that um, the situation is evolving and we're also evolving our emergency operations from a response posture to a recovery uh, posture 
And that is a significant shift for us in terms of us now focusing our attention on the look ahead and what's coming, uh, working with Ottawa Public Health and the various other levels of government that we're engaged with. Um, and I wanted to start on my first slide to give confidence to Council and to our public that one of the themes that is always prevalent in any emergency, regardless of how long it lasts, is our communications and what we're telling the public, what we're telling Council, what we're telling our staff and the media. And that is a, a central focus uh, that we have been paying attention to. The um, communications activities are managed through our Emergency Information Centre, which is part of the Emergency Operations Centre, uh, now that we're in a state of emergency. And it coordinates all information from all departments, EOC, Public Health, and our external partners at the Ottawa Hospital. And we are updating city channels in real time, seven days a week, based on the new information we received. Um, we're giving regular updates to the city's various communication channels. Uh, we're public broadcasting through their regular uh, media availability. City Council, Ottawa Board of Health meetings are available on YouTube. And we're announcing all new initiatives and special announcements uh, through memos, city communication channels where applicable. And from day one, uh, we, we always had in our, in our toolkit the council liaison role. And from day one, I firmly believe, based on the way this was going, that we needed to expand that role. So we really staffed up our council liaison role so that um, it could be, it, it was able to respond to council and council offices from their own inquiries and from their constituent inquiries. And uh, we've also added that function to the Human Needs Task Force because a lot of inquiries were coming into that. So we created a, a group of people who are dedicated to responding to our councillors and constituency uh, needs, and they've been doing an outstanding job. Uh, responding on a daily basis and on my third slide I want to give you a sense of the numbers our council liaison uh, uh, function has dealt with 870 inquiries from councillors our human needs task force has uh, dealt with 100 inquiries from councillors and Ottawa Public Health has dealt with 627 uh, uh, inquiries for almost 1600 inquiries total since this started just over a month ago. Our top themes are number one, access to parks and playgrounds. Number two, closure of non-essential businesses and services. Number three, housing, shelter and supports for our most vulnerable. Number four, it was enforcement of closures in the Quarantine Act. And number five, the ongoing public health measures such as physical distancing, self-isolation, guidelines, testing, and guidelines for multi-use dwellings. Um, and this does not include the call-outs. One of the things we've added to the council liaison that I felt was important was our council liaison divide up the councillors and call councillors directly on a weekly basis to ensure that we are hearing what their needs are and we speak to them uh, personally. And this doesn't include these numbers, the hundreds of calls staff have with individual councillors, either staff calling councillors or councillors calling staff uh, to make inquiries uh, on specific issues. On slide four, I um, want to give you a little sense by the numbers. City of Ottawa and Ottawa Public Health website visits have totaled almost 2.3 million since this has started. Our social media posts uh, have been over 13 million. The City of Ottawa and Public Health social media posts have been 2,261. We've issued uh, 84 products, which are feature stories, public service announcements, memos from departments on specific uh, decisions that have been made by the EOC, uh, specific actions that have been taken, specific uh, changes to legislation and announcements, uh, media advisories and news releases. We've had 24 media availabilities led by the City of Ottawa and Ottawa Public Health. Uh, 440,000 residences have received the direct mail out uh, that Public Health sent out that we supported. We've posted over 5,000 signs in parks and we've had over 5.6 million hits on print, social media and digital. And our media inquiries have totaled 249. Um, I can tell you that in our, in our um, inquiries, uh, we are 90% uh, closure on the inquiries we received uh, from council. So we're, we're tracking those really hard. I want to turn my attention to slide six on the way forward. Um, we continue to focus on emergency response and planning to sustain and recover and rebuild services. And now we're shifting into recovery in the rebuild phases of the pandemic. And with that, uh, our senior leadership team and the OCG have decided that we need to, have, to add four more task teams 
um, to our uh, structure, emergency management structure, because we need to focus on the future. We can't get caught not being prepared as the economy starts opening up and announcements start coming from the province and from the federal, provincial and federal government. And the context for this is that um, residents are looking for city services to assist them to getting back to their everyday lives. And I think that um, right now the definition of normal will change for a while, as, count, as uh, Dr. Etch has said. Uh, what that will look like exactly will evolve, and we're trying to figure that out as our other levels of government. And we are working very collaboratively with the federal and provincial government uh, uh, bureaucracies and other large cities across the country uh, to provide input and feedback in terms of which sectors may open first, what may be the impacts, and what are the things that need to be in place for them to be able to open, and how do we respond as a city to be able to support the, that opening of the economy and opening of our services from a staff perspective. So our focus right now is on human safety, supporting our employees, maintaining appropriate city services to our community, and sustaining the economic resilience of our organization in the city. On slide eight, um, I have a revised structure that is the, now the Emergency Operations Center, which is, as you can see at the top, is headed by the uh, Emergency Operations Control Group. That is the uh, team made up of all the general managers of all city departments and myself chairing it uh, with the police chief, fire chief, paramedic chief, bylaw chief, CEO of the Ottawa Public Library, medical officer of health. Uh, are all at the table, and uh, sometimes the hospitals and other external agencies also um, uh, join us. Um, and the way it's structured is that uh, we have basically four key sections, operations section, planning, logistics, and finance administration. The human needs task force is under the operations because that's evolving and emerging issues every day. They are literally adjusting hourly to changes, to legislative changes, to issues emerging in our community. And uh, the Human Needs Task Force, which is led by uh, Donna and uh, Claire Friere, who's the, uh, the uh, key lead on behalf of the department, and our community partners are under the structure of the OC. We've now added four task teams, a people task team, a finance task team, a services task team, an economic recovery task team. And I want to take just a couple minutes to explain what the role of each one of these are uh, before I turn it over to uh, the next presenter. I'll start with the people task team, which is slide nine. Uh, Valerie Turner is the executive sponsor of this team. She's the general manager of Innovative Client Services. And her role really is to, uh, is to, is to preserve, protect, and optimize the deployment of, of our staff and support, and support our staff as we enter into uh, the new uh, uh, opening of the economy and as our services start to come back. So she's focusing very much on uh, what the workplace will look like, what the health and safety needs will be of our employees, um, how do we normalize work from home and support productivity, uh, mental health and employee assistance programs and other supports our staff are going to need as they come back, uh, how do we strengthen our relationships and ensure consistency across our bargaining agents so that we are consistent in how we apply our policies and practices in the workplace. Uh, how do we evolve our needs in terms of uh, workforce analysis, uh, HR policies and process? And how do we ensure our staff feel confident that they can come back to work, the ones that are going to be coming back into the workplace, that they can come back feeling safe so that they can do the jobs that so much, so neatly, uh, badly need them to do? Our next task force on slide 10 is our finance task team, and Wendy will be providing an update on our finances immediately after my presentation. And Wendy Stephenson, our Chief Financial Officer, City Treasurer, is Executive Sponsor, and her mandate is to look at the 2020 budget and develop a financial forecast for, and recovery plan for 2021 budget cycle and beyond. Everyone is focusing on the economic hit and the financial hit to you know businesses and governments, and from my perspective, the city, um, in terms of what's happening in 2020 and what we need to do to, uh, to close the gap in terms of the deficit we're running versus the expenditures we have and the increased costs we have in some cases. The real issue is going to be 2021 and how do we go into 2021 and what assumptions have to change that we've been making in our terms of our long-range financial forecast and in terms of uh, uh, the assumptions on budget pressures, et cetera, and revenues that we've made and are forecasting into the future, those have to be revisited. And uh, Wendy will be, is, uh, has a team that is um, focusing on this year operating in capital budgets and will be focusing very much on 2021 and 2022 to give council a line of sight 
in terms of where we're, where are we going and what uh, adjustments do we have to make in terms of not only our initiatives and work plans, but in terms of the financial decisions council uh, have to make. The third task force is the services uh, task team on page 11. Slide 11, Dan Chenier, our general manager of recreation, culture and facility services is the executive sponsor. And Dan's job is to look at all services in the city and develop a recovery strategy so we can resume operations in a phased and thoughtful approach. And that is a very complicated uh, function to do. He's, uh, he's uh, going to be working and has a team, integrated team of all representatives from the departments to look at how do we open up and how do we make it safe for employees to be at work and for our residents to have contact with their employees uh, in the work environment and to still deliver services uh, virtually and, uh, and, and maintain some of the uh, structure that we've set up to date. So Dan's going to be coordinating and prioritizing uh, our external supply and uh, service and supply chain to, to support us. He's going to be aligning the strategy and deployment of staff and he's going to be looking at reestablishing department plans and service plans so we get back uh, into business and reopen many of our, all our facilities that have been closed. How does that happen? There's a lot of thought that has to go into that. Um, and the fourth team is the Economic Recovery Task Team, which is sponsored by Steve Willis, the General Manager of Planning, Infrastructure, and Economic Development. And Steve's job is to really look outward into the community and to develop Ottawa's re uh, economic relief and recovery strategy, ensure we have alignment with our federal and provincial partners. We're talking to them on a regular basis, and they're asking for our input on how they're going to do that and continue to engage uh, Ottawa Public Health, who's part of this team, to ensure that we can support the opening of the economy. Uh, for example, you know, residential and public projects, the whole construction sector coming back. Steve plays a big role with his inspectors, his officials, his planning department people, his right-of-way people, all the permitting people. All those people have a huge role in helping our businesses get back up and running and supporting them and playing the regulatory role that we'll be asked to play. And we're also doing an economic sector analysis to identify which sectors need uh, different support so we can be strategic about how we support the different economic uh, sectors. And we're doing that as I advised last time with uh, five other major cities in Canada where we're looking at sector-by-sector -sector analysis so we'll have more input to provide to uh, council and a better view and line of sight of who's struggling and who's getting back on their feet quicker. Uh, uh, Steve will also be looking at our legislative priorities, uh, so city strategic plan, official plan, transportation master plan. We have big bodies of work. This was supposed to be a huge uh, year for policy and legislative agenda. Steve has to look at that because we need to uh, be able to advise council on which projects we're recommending to continue and which ones have to be deferred or what adjustments have to be made to be able to deliver uh, the priorities in our strategic plan and the other major policy pieces that council was expecting us to move forward this year. And we're concerned that some of these uh, may not be possible to move forward, but we need to take a hard look at that so we can plan the legislative agenda for committee and council uh, going forward. And now, Mayor, uh, would like to turn it over to uh, Wendy Stephenson, who's going to do part two of my presentation on giving a financial uh, update on the financial impact of COVID-19. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Uh, thank you, Steve, and good morning, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council. Today, I'm going to provide an update on the city's financial impact of the COVID-19 pandemic with a focus on the review that we've completed with respect to expenditures and forecasted savings. Moving on to uh, slide 14, which is the financial scenarios. So on April 8th, I provided Council with a summary of the forecasted revenue shortfall and some examples of the cost impacts. We now have a more comprehensive analysis of the cost impacts, but it's also really important to note that the update today is based on what we know so far. These numbers are subject to change as we gain further insights and experience in operating in this new environment and maintaining our essential services while requiring physical distancing. The most significant impacts on the city's budget is the closure of the recreational culture and community services as well as the library branches. This has had an impact on our revenues and it's also resulted in some reductions of our operating costs. Transit ridership estimates have also been significantly impacted on, and they're reflected in our forecast in terms of shortfalls in revenue. 
We're currently assuming the worst case scenario in terms of 100% fare reduction starting in April. However, uh, once we obtain the actual results for April and analyze those, we'll be able to provide a more accurate forecast in terms of what that fare revenue reduction is going to look like going forward. And these revised estimates will be provided in our next financial update. Other assumptions that are built into the estimates that I'll be presenting to you today include reductions in our parking and parking ticket revenues of 30% and approximately 67% respectively. The financial impacts presented today are based on the three scenarios that we discussed at the last council meeting. Scenario one, where we return to more regular operations uh, occurring in June. And scenario two assumes a return in September. And the worst case scenario, which is scenario three, which is a return to normal at the end of December. So throughout the presentation this morning, I'm going to focus on the medium impact scenario, which assumes a September resumption date. And my presentation is both uh, based on three areas. We're going to focus on the transit budget, the tax supported services, and the rate supported services. We're on to um, the next slide, which is the transit impacts. So starting with transit, it's important to note that these numbers reflect the financial impact of COVID on the city's budget. It's not an estimate of the city's overall operating deficit at the end of the year, as there's some additional financial pressures or savings that will be generated throughout the year as part of our regular operations. For transit services, the most significant impact is the reduction in the fare revenue, which is estimated to be $99.4 million if the pandemic continues until September. There's also some cost savings, particularly in the reduction of the presto fees due to the drop in the presto sales, the reduction in paratranspo contract costs due to significant reduction in parabookings, and reduced overtime and fuel savings due to the reduced bus hours. Some of the initial discretionary cost savings has all, have also been identified for a total forecasted COVID-related transit deficit of $83.8 million for Scenario 2. So moving on to the next slide, which is the financial impacts on the tax-supported budget. For tax-supported services, the most significant impact on rent is revenue on the closure of the recreational facilities and the community centers. The estimated reduction in revenue for these facilities is $38.9 million if the pandemic extends to September. Our investment market has also been very volatile over the last few months, and it's very difficult to predict the investment return in this economic environment. But according to our most recent current market analysis, our investment income could drop by approximately $5.1 million under scenario two due to the lower returns and deferral of taxes and other revenues. An additional impact on the uh, revenue of tax and water bill deferrals is a reduction in our interest income and our user fees. Other areas that could see a drop in revenue is parking and parking ticket revenues for a combined shortfall of $16.2 million under Scenario 2 and Provincial Offenses Act and red light camera revenues. The total forecasted revenue reduction for tax supported services is estimated at $70.4 million under Scenario 2. Moving on to the next slide, I'll speak to um, some of the savings that we may see and increased costs. So the closure of the facilities and the reduction of non-essential services will generate some savings, but the cost of responding to the pandemic also has increased costs in other areas. Casual and part-time staff that were working at the closed recreational facilities have been placed on declared emergency leave, and the cost savings associated with the facility closures are primarily related to the compensation and facilities operating costs, such as material services and utilities. Since there is a projected reduction in transit fare revenues, we're all for also forecasting a reduction in the fare subsidy required for Equipass and ODSP bus passes. Some of the non-essential services related to parks, roads, and forestry will also achieve some savings, primarily in salary costs. There's also a forecasted decrease in costs due to the possible cancellation or deferral of the hazardous waste depots. And this is really dependent on when those services 
recommence or resume. The key areas that we're expecting additional costs related to COVID are primarily for paramedics, fire and emergency management of overtime, leave and equipment, staffing costs in long-term care facilities to provide our 24 by 7 coverage, and higher, hubs, higher housing subsidies for individuals experiencing reduced personal income and increased collection costs for the in-house group due to the increased residential garbage tonnage. The total estimated net decrease in costs for tax-supported services for Scenario 2 to September is approximately $30.2 million. And we're moving on to the summary slide for tax, and this slide summarizes the total forecasted deficit for tax-supported services. It excludes public health, police services, and Ottawa Public Library, which reports separately to each of their boards. I can tell you we're working very closely with our partners to ensure that we're sharing all of our reviews and our financial strategies with them, and we are working hand-in-hand -hand to reduce the gap. The total estimated deficit due to COVID for the tax-supported operations is approximately $35.8 million under Scenario 2. Public Health is currently estimating a COVID-related deficit of $3.8 million to September, and Police is estimating a $1.4 million deficit due to COVID and a $5.9 million if the pandemic extends to December. Library continues to track the revenue and cost impacts, and they'll likely see a net reduction in cost due to the closure of the library branches. We'll move on to the next slide which provides a summary of our rate-supported services. And here you'll see that the impact is much lower. We are projecting some reductions in water billing revenues. Overall consumption is expected to decline due to the closure of non-essential services. The forecast reduction in rate revenue under Scenario 2 is approximately $5.2 million with a reduction of costs of approximately $1.6 million, primarily due to the reduction of non-essential services and service contracts. There are some small discretionary spending savings that have been identified to help offset the overall deficit. And the estimated deficit for the rate-supported services due to COVID is approximately $3.0 million under Scenario 2. We'll move to the summary slide. As mentioned earlier, the most significant impact of COVID on the city's revenue budget is the loss of transit fare revenue and the closure of recreational and cultural facilities. The impact on expenses will fluctuate as the city continues to respond to the pandemic. The demand on staff resources, requirements for additional equipment, the PPNE, and services to respond to this emergency, the support that we provide to our community and a multitude of other operating and economic factors will have an impact on our costs going forward. At this time, we continue to forecast a loss of approximately $30 million in revenues per month, which equates to about $1 million per day. The $30 million per month in lost revenue is offset by approximately $11 million per month in cost reductions and savings. However, we do have additional costs of approximately $5 million per month, and that gives us a net burn rate of approximately $24 million per month as we move through the pandemic. We'll move to the next slide, next steps in our financial strategies. So in terms of next steps, we're going to continue to build on the work that we've done to date to identify reductions in discretionary spending, redeploying staff where they're most needed to best leverage the resources that we have and to delay staffing wherever possible. Our current focus is to secure backstop funding and one-time grants from other levels of government to address our shortfall. In the meantime, we're also looking at our planned capital projects for 2020 to see if any can be deferred and if any projects that are currently listed as work in progress can be closed and any remaining funds can be returned to our reserves and can deal with our forecasted deficit. This analysis of possible funding and financing options will be completed over the next few weeks, and uh, we will develop a set of proposed financial strategies
strategies that are going to be presented at a later date. Uh, and as Steve mentioned in his presentation, we are looking forward uh, to understand the financial impacts flowing into 2021. And it's really important to note that um, what we talked about today are really early estimates and our situation is still very, very fluid. This concludes my update on the financial impacts of COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, Steve, is uh, Donna giving a presentation? Uh, no, Mayor, we, uh, we had thought about, but because we did the uh, media veil on Monday and Donna sent out two comprehensive uh, updates on the Human Services Plan, we felt that we wouldn't do it today. Great. So, Councillor El Shantiri on the flooding, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good morning, uh, my colleagues. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity for, to give you a little bit of update on the Spring Freshet. Obviously, we have some good news. As I mentioned in our last council meeting, I'm working closely with staff to monitor and respond to the freshet this year. I watched firsthand the sandbag being filled and preparation for the freshet, and I'm pleased to see how staff adapted to the physical distance requirement this year. Those filled sandbags have now been deployed in the low-lying areas uh, for the resident to use. In terms of water level, they continue to decrease along the main of the Ottawa River, which is building capacity uh, within the river that seems to support the continued melt north, as you can see this morning. If it's minus 15 in Ottawa, it's probably minus 20 up north. And we were told uh, 60 or 70 percent the snow up north still has not been melted yet. Those are good signs, Mr. Mayor and colleagues. And, and uh, we do not foresee significant flood condition at, uh, at this time. But the forecast change, we have the ability to call and the military to support our response if it's needed, as we will not be able to bring together volunteers the way we did in the past years. I just, uh, our, our staff continue, Mr. Mayor, to monitor the situation closely along uh, along with the uh, Rideau Valley Conservation Authority and the Ottawa River Regulation Planning Board. I would like to thank my council colleagues, especially Councillor DeRouze and Councillor Cavanaugh for the leadership they have shown in, in getting a lot of information on that freshet to the community. I'm happy to take any question, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Suds has a direction to staff. Councillor, if you want to introduce that now, then we'll go to questions. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think as we've heard uh, through the updates this morning, there's many challenges that the city is facing as we start to turn our attention back to the economic recovery. Um, I think we're incredibly fortunate in Ottawa to have literally hundreds of technology companies and thousands of high-tech workers throughout the city. Uh, that really are at our disposal as we work towards recovery. So I think um, as we look at this recovery, as we turn our attention to it, we have the opportunity to leverage this expertise to help us address uh, some of the challenges that we face, um, which could result obviously in better outcomes, a safer, resilient, uh, and efficient return to work. So the city currently has uh, an innovation pilot program in place that accepts applications for piloting of new technologies. Um, I believe we have an opportunity here to leverage that program, but uh, perhaps to be a bit more specific in what it is that we need. Uh, we need solutions and technologies that will help us support our recovery efforts, and that truly needs to be the focus of the program moving forward. Uh, so given this, I, I, and having spoken with staff about this previously, I'd like to uh, direct staff to explore this further uh, specifically that staff explore using the innovation pilot program to issue a challenge to the local technology community to bring forward innovations and solutions that would support the city's recovery efforts. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for that. Uh, any objection by members of council to that direction of staff to staff? And staff are agreeable. Okay, thank you very much. So now we're going to go to um, questions and comments uh, on the, present, the three presentations that we've had, and we'll start based on the, um, 
The roll call sheet, Councillor El Shantiri. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, Dr. Vera did a great job on Monday explaining to us uh, the return to what's so called normal, if that's the term we want to use, but to, to, to the return to start opening uh, some of the economy and some of the businesses and some of the com community center in the city. I, I would like to have Dr. Vera take us a little bit. Uh, how could that, what that picture is going to look like? And I know you did a great job on Monday, so I'm hoping if you can summarize it to my colleague, to myself, as a councillor who co-chaired the economic task force with the mayor, we get a lot of questions about Kingston, what they're doing, or other municipality, what they're doing. And I know we have to follow the provincial uh, emergency management. But what is your plan for the city of Ottawa, working with other colleagues in the public health sector, uh, to take us to the next level? Thank you for your question, councillor. Um, what, uh, what we know is that uh, the, there's harm being created by the uh, direction right now to uh, stay two meters away from others and to not gather in more than five uh, and to not operate non-essential uh, businesses because people are, are, are experiencing financial strain and, and they're not um, being able to connect socially that's important for health. So we want to safely move towards something uh, that is more uh, manageable over the long term. And my, my approach is to uh, work with the province uh, to understand um, what they are thinking, um, you know, in terms of different sectors or different types of work uh, that could go forward uh, in a safe way. Uh, I'm promoting a risk-based approach uh, so that if um, you think about it, uh, every expansion of our activities where we bring ourselves into more contact with others carries a risk of transmission of COVID-19. And some of those types of activities will cause more risk than others. If somebody's outdoors working and they don't come into contact with anybody else, that's much less risky uh, than if we uh, open up a setting where people are side by side in large numbers. And so uh, we want to look at the nature of the risk and we also want to look at how we can mitigate that risk. So if there's a higher risk to that industry or that activity, you know, is there a way we can decrease that risk by operating differently? Can we look at uh, physical distancing in the workplace, continuing to promote working from home, all of these things? So I think there will be some consistency across the province uh, because most of these um, you know, uh, risk assessments are going to apply across the province. Uh, but we are different as a city. We have a higher uh, proportion of people that are in public service. So you know, we still need to think about uh, what it means for us here in, in Ottawa. Uh, the other thing that is on my mind is uh, is, is to build in the feedback we're getting from people in our community. Uh, and the kind of thing that I've heard about the most so far, and we haven't done a formal uh, engagement, which we will, um, is to, to think about the open spaces, the public spaces that people would like to have to get out uh, and be physically active. And I've heard some great suggestions also around a slow slow expansion in the household bubble that we've been trying to maintain around each of our, our households. Um, so there are, are individuals, older adults, who have been really trying to do their part and just keeping to themselves um, so that they aren't at risk to others. And, and the idea of a, a pandemic buddy has surfaced so that, you know, maybe that one older adult can have another um, that they can then have social support across, uh, you know, two households, it becomes a broader household of two. You know, these kinds of options are reasonable, and they, they, they make a lot of sense um, to be able to uh, still provide some protection, but, but make the, the response more sustainable. Uh, you know, the same for, for two households where, uh, you know, potentially children want to play together. So these are the kinds of things that we're talking about, we're exploring. I'm telling you, it's Still not time to implement, so that's that's that we're not there yet. But but please, um, you know these ideas are good to keep feeding in, so that we can have a plan um, that that makes sense to everyone going forward. 
The other, um, you know, kind of conversation here uh, that's important is uh, that there are values involved. So there are some facts we can try to collect about the risk to different behaviors or industries, but there's also values. And, and one of the values that I've seen in our community is that we want to protect the most vulnerable. And that means, you know, right now what we're seeing is people in long-term care homes and retirement homes who are at most risk of death. And we want to protect them uh, for, for a, a longer period of time as much as possible. And so that is also part uh, of the thinking. Uh, as we go forward, we want to think about who is most at risk and, and vulnerable and how do we protect those populations in an ongoing way. Uh, and, and how do we do this fairly? So I ho hope that uh, covers some more of the ground that, that you were hoping I could speak to, Councillor. It, it did. Uh, if I may, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hatchett, for your uh, insightful and, and, and really helpful information because we get a lot of questions from uh, our business community and that really shed some light and, and, uh, on the return. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I don't have a question to the city manager, but I want to thank all the general managers and the city manager for under liaison because they were available to us at all times. Uh, I know we didn't have a flood, but I have to tell you, being prepared for one, it helped us a lot and it helped our community on the waterfront tremendously. Now in the city, even during COVID-19, they're still uh, prepared to help the community in, in the flood. And I want to thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your uh, uh, trust in me to, uh, to, to, uh, to work with our city staff. And I want to say thanks to all the staff who help us with the we're not over yet, but at least we, we are in good shape. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great, and thank you, Councillor, and uh, appreciate you uh, passing along the thanks to Councillor DeRuz, who's uh, dealing with the Cumberland Ward and Councillor Cavanaugh in, in her ward. Uh, next is Councillor Egli, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, yes, I also want to thank all the all the uh, senior management uh, for the work they're doing, uh, especially uh, the city manager. I've reached out to him uh, several times, different times a day, different days of the week, and he's always available to take a question or a comment. So thank you for that. On that, I do have a question. We had spoken during the update, uh, the public health update, around the uh, efforts that have been made to put information online in a variety of languages. Uh, we continue to struggle uh, and, uh, with the use of our public spaces, especially parks. And Mr. Kanalak, as well, I understand it, it's probably not practically or economically feasible to have signage made up in 20 or 30 different languages. Are we working towards perhaps uh, an infographic type of sign to be put in the parks that, that people could understand regardless of what their 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 native tongue is to to, to get that um, that message across um, thank you mr. mayor I know uh, there's an incredible effort by Ottawa public health on their website and the material and their uh, public information need relations team to translate in multiple languages, there's a big effort going on right now to reach those hard uh, to reach communities. Uh, and so that is ongoing, and I forget how many languages they're translating it in, but it, it was dozens. Um, the, maybe I'll, I'd like to ask Dan Chenye, because uh, he's been uh, leading, um, and Kevin Wiley, they've been leading the, uh, the um, uh, initiative to sign the parks and to look at all that. So Dan or Kevin, do you want to offer your comments on where we're at with that? Uh, sure, Steve. Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's Dan Chenier. Uh, yes, we have an infographic, uh, a different infographic than the 5,000 signs that were put up. Uh, I will be circulating that to members of council um, earlier or later this morning. Uh, the infographic think, uh, focuses a bit more on uh, not so much the park closures, but the types of activities that people are discouraged from doing. Uh, and it's all infographics, there are no languages, so it speaks to the, uh, to the messaging we've been getting that in some communities uh, the, the English and French signs are not understood. And uh, we will have that infographic circulated to members of council uh, as soon as council is over. Thanks very much, 
Marcia, and I'm Sandy, will, will we be putting those up in the parks as well, or will we be just using social media? Uh, the first wave is for social media, and uh, we may look at some targeted. We, we've had through uh, bylaw services and through other sources uh, some indications of the locations where we've had those issues. We can look at perhaps a, a limited run of, uh, of those signs to address uh, specific areas where, where we're, we're getting that feedback. Okay, thank you very much for your efforts. All right, anything else, Councillor? No, oh, that's good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Right. Thank you uh, very much. Councillor Tierney, please. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, uh, it's great news about those infographics, uh, Dan. Uh, that was a question I actually had, so that's great news. Uh, on the Parks and Rec side, uh, currently uh, all the Parks and Recs uh, were not taking bookings uh, before June 30th. And I don't know who's best to answer that. Are we still on track for that? Or is this? do you think things will start, uh, it may go further than that? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's, it's Steve Kanlakis. Um, no, we have not made, uh, to the council, we have not made um, uh, a decision on that yet. We're now uh, uh, waiting to see what the province is going to be directing in terms of the uh, the, the uh, um, expansion of, uh, or the opening up of the economy and uh, social distancing, um, relaxing that. And so we are watching that. We, we talk every day as the emergency operations control group it's on our agenda in terms of uh, that timeline. Right now, we put that out there. Most other cities have, have to give people a line of sight in terms of what to expect. But the moment we know that we're going to be relaxing that, we'll be uh, announcing that first to our council. But as of now, we're still uh, looking at June 30th, not issuing permits. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. And uh, my next question is uh, for Dr. Etches. Uh, great job, by the way. Um, and obviously top of mind is a lot of our seniors' homes in my neck of the woods, Laurie Manor for sure, uh, is a concern. But I did see something this morning, and I know you probably talk to the province, uh, if not daily, hourly, uh, about Ontario's going to do proactive uh, COVID-19 surveillance testing in all nursing homes, immediately testing all residents uh, and staff in homes with outbreaks, and testing homes with uh, non-symptomatic uh, residents or staff. That's a That's a pretty big piece of information. How, how much information do you know on that and how soon will it go into effect here in Ottawa? Um, the, the guidance or, or um, you know, information that this is the direction to go in came out late last night and so today we're working uh, to get some more detailed information about the implementation plan. Um, we certainly will be following the provincial guidance uh, here in Ottawa and, and, and across the area. Um, it will require partnership uh, with our uh, hospital and healthcare sector um, and, and the long-term care uh, homes themselves. So this is something that um, we started discussing uh, as soon as we saw it and, and we'll, we'll keep um, you know, advancing a plan uh, so that it can be done in a coordinated way. Okay, great. So, so uh, I look forward to seeing some of those and if... Uh I think it's good to keep uh, council updated on that, especially with the hot spot ones. I, I'm thinking of a, Jan has a home in her area, uh, and of course Laurier Manor. Uh, we've seen those numbers spike quite a bit. So anyway, I'll keep I'll keep it at that, Mr. Mayor. We have a long meeting ahead, and I just want to thank everybody today. Right. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. Councillor Gower, please. Uh, thank you very much. I do have one question for Dr. Etches, and it's a question that we received a number of times from residents, and I was hoping you can just clarify um, public health's approach on this. We have residents asking, how many specific cases are there in our community, in our ward? And I know up to now, uh, Ottawa Public Health has, has been providing citywide numbers. Can you just clarify or explain for residents why you're taking this approach? Uh, sure. Yeah, and, and I can provide an update on where we're going as well. So the, the, the information that the public needed, um, you know, early on, and, and continuing was that COVID-19 is in the community and your risk of picking up COVID-19 uh, is there across the whole community. Uh, and so, you know, we needed to treat um, interaction with others uh, wherever you were in Ottawa as a potential risk uh, for, for transmission of COVID-19. The information we have about individual cases does include uh, 
geography. Uh, it includes postal codes. Uh, it includes, you know, gender and age and um, indigenous status uh, as well. Uh, we're looking at adding in information uh, about ethnicity uh, as we go forward with a new a uh, case management tool that is uh, more automated and, and gets us away from a paper-based uh, process. And so we have started to look at how we map uh, those cases across the city, and we will do that uh, and, and make that available um, going forward. Uh, the protection of privacy is always... And so when you have low numbers of cases, uh, you don't want to publish something or a map that identifies, you know, an individual uh, potentially uh, being positive. Um, but this is, this is the kind of information that, uh, you know, as we go forward and we want to try to um, be more targeted, uh, geographical information is useful. Uh, we are looking at uh, working with developers to implement a contact tracing system that's an app that people can have on their phones, and it's a consent-based uh, approach where people have to voluntarily uh, decide they want the app on their phone, and then um, if they test positive, they can voluntarily, again, uh, give us the geographical information about where they've been in that period prior to uh, becoming positive. Um, so all, all of this information, uh, you know, becomes uh, something that we can look at summarizing and, and putting out to the public also to inform um, their, their activities. The basic message is still the same, that for anyone across Ottawa, wherever you are, if you have an interaction with someone else, it still could lead to transmission of COVID-19 if you're not uh, staying two meters away because we have asymptomatic cases. We have people who are pre-symptomatic. They don't realize they're infected yet. Um, and so we still need to keep that in mind for foremost. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Okay, thank you, Councillor Gower. Councillor DeRuz, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, want to thank, of course, uh, echo all my colleagues, uh, uh, thanking our uh, city staff and management, of course, uh, and the leadership uh, uh, for, your, uh, for you, Mr. Mayor. But I also want to thank Councillor Shantiri, and I do have a quick question for Dr. Echiv. Uh, doctor, concerning the long-term residents, right now we're not doing testing unless we do have a case or we have an expected case or we have someone with symptoms. Why we're not testing uh, everyone at the long-term home? Specifically now we know and what we've seen of the data that we've been getting, most hit are, they are the long-term homes. Uh, in uh, my area, we have a long-term uh, facility and we're not able to test everyone, including staff and residents. Can you just a little bit call, uh, 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 give us some information why we're not doing all these testing and we keep saying we need more testing? Yes, um, so I think uh, the testing strategy continues to evolve. Uh, as was mentioned, there's new guidance from the ministry last night and uh, we're looking for more details of, about um, their thoughts uh, on how to implement that and roll it out. Um, the, the challenge uh, is always to think about um, any risk uh, of an approach and what you'll do with the information and um, what is uh, you know, most important to keep in place to protect residents and staff in long-term care homes and retirement homes. Uh, it's the physical work of putting up barriers with gloves and gowns and masks and, and, and the way people interact with each other and the processes they use to control the spread of infection that is most important. So the, um, the testing is, is one piece of the toolkit um, that we'll continue to use and we'll continue to roll out um, where it's needed and, and um, what, what the province uh, you know, has, has indicated um, could be useful in a surveillance kind of role. Um, but what we also want to do at the same time is make sure that these other practices which will protect people on an ongoing basis are in place because any test at one point in time uh, only gives you the picture right then. Uh, it doesn't necessarily um, capture everything or tell you 
uh, what's happening you know, tomorrow or the next day. What we need to have in place are those infection prevention and control measures that protect people every day. Uh, thank you, Doctor. As long as I just, uh, we are, I'm just trying to relay the messages what we're hearing from our long-term facilities and our executive director, the nurses, and our, and, and I appreciate all the work you do. But if you ke if you keep advocating and keep us updated on how, uh, how, the, what the messages we're getting from the province, because we're really in the need to do more testing in those uh, vulnerable areas, specifically in the long term. Thank you very much, Doctor. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor DeRuz. Uh, Conseil Fleury, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Monsieur le Maire. Et puis, uh, moi aussi, j'aimerais ça... Uh, I also want to uh, reiterate what was said so far. Uh, thank you to uh, management for updating us. Um, they relate mainly to the financial side, and I wonder, uh, Wendy alluded to the end of her, at her, the end of our presentation about uh, looking for one-time grants or sources of funding. Uh, I wonder, uh, what is our coordinated approach for those asks? Is, it, uh, is the mayor proceeding with that? Is, is that conducted through uh, Wendy's shop or, or Steve's shop? Because I think a lot of those asks, like for example, we on a regular basis hear from commercial property taxes uh, asking for what relief is available. Uh, we've heard recently about the uh, the housing, um, the housing ask, especially around hotels, and then uh, obviously the tourism sector as a specific risk following uh, the, uh, the 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 reopening of some of the, of the services. So I wonder who's coordinating our ask and how that will be, uh, how are we going to involve council? Yeah, if I could just uh, offer a comment on that, uh, councillor. Um, uh, any ask for uh, the city, the corporation of the city of Ottawa for our shortfall uh, has been uh, coordinated through the big city mayor's caucus and LUMCO at the provincial level. So we're now in the midst of discussions with uh, the Deputy Prime Minister um, and other ministers at the federal level on a weekly call. And um, ultimately, um, you know, we, we're going to put forward our best case in terms of uh, funding, whether it be one time or, or base funding for uh, the shortfalls we've, we've, um, we're having to deal with as a result of COVID-19. With respect to other sectors like tourism and so on, um, we're advocating, obviously, for those areas, but it's primarily their associations that are taking the lead on that. And the federal government, as you know, almost every day has a different announcement uh, to help another sector. So uh, we hope that uh, they take into account some of the areas, you know, whether it be uh, housing or tourism or, um, or other small business uh, challenges that, that our companies and local businesses are facing. So uh, at this point, um, we don't have, obviously, a firm commitment from the federal government with respect to funding um, cities, but they've been very uh, open to suggestions that we brought forward on everything from uh, gas tax to uh, grants to uh, base funding. So the minute we have um, something from the feds, then obviously I'll be uh, pleased to bring it to council. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The uh, just the, the additional piece to that is obviously we are all court, we all in regular conversations with our MPs and MPPs, and it came up in, in our conversation of what what is the ask uh, as it relates to you know purchasing of housing or hotels or whatever it is. So I, w maybe we can take that offline because I don't want us to individually have different asks and then confuse our senior levels of government uh, in, in that regard. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good approach. I would uh, encourage members of council uh, that uh, have ideas that to funnel them through my office so that we don't uh, send a mixed message uh, asking one group of um, MPs or MPPs uh, for a certain amount and then another group another amount. So I think if we can coordinate it, if you have those kinds of ideas. I know that uh, Donna um, has uh, had some discussions with respect to uh, hotels and so on that she's looking into right now. Uh, but again, those are uh, really depending, dependent on us getting some funding from the other two orders of government. Great. I'll continue to be brief, Mr. Mayor. I just on the isolation spaces, I want to applaud staff and their efforts to working with the community partners 
uh, on that front. Uh, I do want to identify a risk. So, as you know, many of the families are staying in local motels, and now uh, some of them have been moved to other hotels and uh, University of Ottawa residences. And now those families are reaching out to us and saying, well, I'm not going back to the other spaces. So I I'm not expecting us to have an answer today, but I do want to flag that as a going forward issue, uh, all tied into our, our previous motion on uh, the, the housing emergency that we passed. So just flagging that. Um, maybe maybe as a, as a wrap-up question comment, uh, want to thank staff on developing the seniors plan uh, specifically for rural and vulnerable seniors, including Ottawa Community Housing. Uh, I'm, uh, I'll be excited to share uh, the general numbers of how many seniors were reached uh, uh, at OCH uh, as that information becomes available. And maybe just as a wrap-up comment, uh, from Steve or Dan, uh, as it relates to summer temporary employment. So a lot of the students, well, everyone's home, but they rely on some of the part-time summer student. We saw the financial outlook. We hear about the June 30th deadline. Uh, what's our expectation for those uh, temporary part-time students over the summer? Uh, and what information can we relate to them now so that they can start making alternate decisions if that's the case? Uh, Dan, you want to take this one? Yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor, it's, uh, it's Dan again. Um, we are still in contact. We, we Our summer recruitment process has gone ahead. Uh, we have set for ourselves to uh, put confirmation of any hiring or of any program decisions until at least May the 1st, uh, and I know that's going to come around quickly. Uh, but until we get a clear line of sight in terms of the level of programming that we're going to be offering uh, and how we're going to phase that back in at some point, uh, we're not making uh, hiring commitments at this point since we're simply not certain of the level of service that we're going to be providing in July and August at this point. Okay. Anything else, okay. Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Merci. Councillor Hubley, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I don't have any questions at this time. What I wanted to ask has already been asked. Thank you. Councillor Menard. Thanks very much, Mayor. Uh, most of my questions were answered at that uh, Board of Health meeting on Monday, which was very helpful. I, I want to reiterate one around the open spaces in our parks, uh, particularly for underserved communities uh, and those living in apartment buildings and without access to yards. We continue to get requests from folks. And so I guess the, the question for the benefit of council is, is OPH asking the province to begin to lift the restrictions regarding the open spaces in parks as one of the first methods of, of harm reduction while still maintaining distancing requirements? It's, it's, yeah, it's Vera here. Um, yes, I think th these are the things that as we have a, a formal engagement from the Ottawa community that we want to feed back to the province as they're doing their work uh, in terms of their priority setting and their their plan um, for relaxing restrictions, um, that, that is the kind of thing that we would be sharing. Okay, thanks very much, Beth. Great, thank you. Councillor Dudas, please. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I am um, I'm gravely concerned about the impact that this is going to have on our city's budget, um, not just for this year, but, you know, uh, Mr. Kanalakos had indicated that we're going to see a significant ripple effect into next year's budget, and goodness knows how for how long. I'm just wondering, I know it's very, very early, and we don't know exactly how long this will take and which scenario is going to play out in terms of the timelines. But um, I'm just wondering if, say, Wendy or Steve can speak to the fact of how do we think this might impact our city's ability to deliver core operations going forward um, in terms of the day-to-day? -day? Will this potentially impact our ability uh, for staffing levels? And are we looking at uh, how our city staff and our, op our delivery of operations are being delivered today and if, if we can adjust it uh, to make our, us more resilient to potential situations like in this, this in the future. Mr. Mayor, I'll start, and then Wendy can, um, can close off on the financial end. Um, thank you for the question, Councillor. The, the, uh, 
one of the main uh, focuses that we have right now is on our, our staff and the redeployment of staff. We have a, uh, as part of our task team and our people task team, um, what they have looked at and done the analysis is how many employees are in the organization who are in a situation because they can't fulfill the job because of personal reasons or the nature of their job is no longer being performed because we've closed uh, that service and or we're not delivering that service anymore. And we've identified about um, 530 people in the organization who are in that situation. And we basically have contacted or in the process of contacting them all because we've identified the high priority areas in the organization that we need to uh, redeploy staff to be able to sustain services, particularly in the social services area uh, and in public health. And there's a, a number of other ones now that uh, we're seeing some pressure. And so what we're doing is, is ensuring that um, we don't have um, staff that uh, are home uh, that aren't uh, contributing and, um, and, and helping deliver service when we need it most. So we are monitoring that very carefully. We are also, um, you know, this, is, this will happen after, but in terms of uh, post-operations uh, uh, review, we will be looking at, um, and, and I was on a conference call yesterday with a bunch of business leaders, Everyone seems to be, you know, the, the mindset is really converging. Everyone is looking at how should your organization be structured post this event to be able to be more resilient as you go forward. And that's something we're going to have to look at in the future in terms of nimbleness and where do we have to have our people. But for now, our immediate focus is we have pressures in certain areas of the city. And uh, we need uh, all our people to be able to contribute to that. So contrary to what we initially thought that where there'd be, you know, thousands of people not doing anything, uh, most of our city services or all of our city services, other than maybe uh, 1%, a couple percent, are, uh, are actively still engaged and just delivering the services um, very differently. And, um, and so we have uh, we've been focusing on where... Uh, we need to uh, deploy to help service areas that are struggling, and that's what our focus is on over the next uh, two weeks until the first week of May. So, Wendy, do you want to talk about the, uh, the financial look? Sure. Thanks, Steve. Um, I think there's two important pieces here. So, first is the fact that it's still very early on. Um, we're really trying to get a grasp and an understanding in terms of what it looks like now for us and then forecast that piece into the future. So much to your point, Councillor, I agree. Um, we need to understand what the impact is going to be or what that ripple effect is going to be into 2021. And that's some of the work that we're going to be doing over the next couple of months in terms of, I'm going to say, some usual assumptions that we make in developing our budget. And do we need to tweak those and what impact that will have? Because then we're going to have to make some adjustments. So um, when Steve spoke about uh, the financial task force, that is part and parcel of the work that's going to be done through that. And we will be reporting back uh, to council in terms of what that landscape looks like. I just think the second piece to this um, that's really important and what we've seen throughout this uh, pandemic response and how the city has reacted um, is how we've actually functioned and changed the way that we've delivered our services. Um, as Steve said, we're delivering, uh, you know, almost, uh, I want to say 98% of, of what we need to, but we're doing it very differently. And I think that there's some big opportunities that we have here um, to be able to deliver those services in a different way. And so we'll be looking at that as well in terms of our overall view as we move forward into the future. Thank you so much for that, and uh, I appreciate the updates. I also appreciate all the work that city staff and Ottawa Public Health and, and our essential services and our frontline workers are, are providing. So thank you very much for me. Great. Thank you, Councillor Dudas. Councillor Meehan, please. Councillor Meehan, the mute button. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, now we can. Uh, Thank you very much, and thank you to everybody for their great updates. Um, I think that Steve actually answered one of my questions, and that is with the possible redeployment of uh, some of our workforce. Um, Steve, uh, if I can direct my question to you, have you, um, have you figured out or do we know exactly what percentage of our workforce might be, and for lack of a better term, I'll call underutilized? Uh, I'm thinking specifically if, uh, if you've worked with the union to 
um, identify who might be redeployed. I was thinking that some, we could maybe uh, put a, individuals at some of the city parks that would wear a red vest, much like uh, they did an LRT, to just reinforce some of the uh, distancing rules. Maybe uh, if we did this and they pa passed out information at the park entrances, we could avoid some of the fines or some of the um, confrontations or some of the um, you know little skirmishes that have been happening in our city parks. But that's just what I'm thinking. If we could do something like that, I think it would be a great idea if the unions and, and the staff were amenable to that. Is, um, has that been considered at all? Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you, uh, Councillor. No, we hadn't um, actually thought of that. We, um, uh, as I said, we have about 532 or 530 people that we've identified that are underutilized right now and for various reasons. Um, but you know what, if you allow me, I'd like to take that back to our emergency operations group and sort of uh, do an assessment if, you know, what kind of call volume and problems are we having in the park still and whether there's some uh, benefit to um, doing some more proactive measures uh, rather than having people, um, you know, inadvertently walk into a situation and mm -hmm. then uh, and then get into trouble. So I'd like to take that back to the team and, uh, and consider that in terms of our redeployment strategy, if you don't mind, Councillor. That, that would be that would be great because I, I think that uh, you know the human aspect of it, um, people just I think it would be a safe job just to try to explain to people yeah don't work you know if you your family but keep distancing away from other people um, these are the rules and regulations and we can avoid problems but um, you know a, a team like that they they did a wonderful job on the LRT and I think we could really use them in, in this situation so yes I would love if you took that back one other quick question. Um, I think, I don't know if this goes to Wendy. Uh, Wendy, in terms of um, lost uh, revenue and cost, and uh, have we figured in, are we paying uh, Rito Transit uh, Group our $5 million a month right now? Uh, are, we, are we continuing to do that given that the trains are not full? We haven't had any problems, so are, are we continuing to, to issue that payment? Uh, Steve, do you want me to take that or do you want to answer that? Well, uh, John, are you on the line? Yes, I am, Steve. Could you please uh, take that because we've been uh, engaged in that topic. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, as council knows, the uh, the only maintenance payment we made is the one that we have uh, uh, advised you of. Uh, okay. There's been no other there's been no other maintenance payments to date. Um, what uh, what we are working on right now is uh, looking at the April payment, uh, which there's requirements if they do achieve uh, the service with the reduced fleet count, they'll be entitled to a payment on that, and we've made it very clear to RTG we just pay them for what they're entitled to. Um, there is active discussions ongoing right now with RTG about the holdback. As you know, we've held back uh, millions and millions of dollars of payments and we still are waiting uh, their invoices for uh, January, which, as you know, was a very difficult month, and February. Uh, we have received their December uh, invoice, which um, I know it's, uh, it's a distant memory right now, but they did have a, a fairly decent December, so they might be entitled, and I emphasize might, be entitled to some payments on that. And what we're doing, uh, Mr. Mayor, is we're going to reconcile all that information, and if we are going to proceed to any payment to RTG, as we said uh, last time, we will advise council. Thank you for that, Mr. Metzoni. Thank you. Is, uh, you Sorry. said there's no maintenance payment. Is there any other payment that that they have been uh, they have received? No, uh, we are working our way through the disputes that you were briefed uh, through in camera. And, and again, if we do give any payments, uh, we'll advise you on the maintenance uh, directly via memo. And uh, then there's also the quarterly updates, which I know we're working on one uh, that should be out shortly. If there's any payments on the uh, capital side of things, we'll do that. But again, we're working through them uh, literally line by line on the disputes uh, and uh, the updates that we gave you in camera. Okay, I appreciate that. That's all my questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Luloff, please. 
Merci, Monsieur le maire. Je veux simplement remercier. Well, thank you. I'd just like uh, to thank uh, all the citizens of Ottawa and Orleans uh, for following uh, Ottawa Public Health uh, directives. I pray for the hard work bringing programming like Baby Time and bilingual children's story time into our homes online. I understand firsthand how difficult it is to break up your day and to keep things interesting for our young children, so thank you very much for that. Uh, and Mr. Chenier, uh, quel type de programmation en ligne? Mr. Chenier. It, would it be possible to provide online uh, recreational services uh, for parks, for example? Aquatic leadership courses to help ensure that we're prepared for after the pandemic. It seems to me that this might be a way uh, to curb some of the budget shortfalls that we're experiencing with innovative ways to bring this kind of programming online. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we are looking at uh, some online possibilities, both in terms of uh, children's activities and uh, we have something that should be rolling out fairly shortly where folks can interact with uh, Dexter, our mascot, uh, their uh, online Friday coloring events with uh, different templates of Dexter doing uh, things relating to safe distancing and washing hands and those kinds of things. We're also exploring for, um, uh, as we move into summer, if we're not going to roll out complete uh, on-site programming, whether we can expand into more online uh, in the area of fitness, in the area of certification that you mentioned, those are all possibilities and things that our uh, programming and our communication staff are working together on. Uh, and uh, we're hopeful that we'll be able to start to roll them out, as I said, probably in within uh, the next 10 days to two weeks uh, in terms of summer offerings uh, as, as we get clearer on uh, how much of the things we're going to be doing are, are live and how much will be virtual. That's awesome that uh, you're already working on that, Dan. Thank you for that. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, some some revenue generation might, might be able to occur if uh, we're able to run some of those dry portions of aquatic leadership courses and first aid. So I'm really glad that, uh, that you guys are looking at that. And uh, so thanks to all the GMs and your staff uh, for your hard work. Uh, I have no further questions at this time, Mr. Mayor. Merci, Conseil Lulov. Councillor Kavanaugh, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mayor, um, and thanks to everyone for their presentations. Um, I'll do quick thank yous. Uh, thank you to Councillor Elshantiri for being ready in case there was a flood, and we're very grateful there isn't. Um, I'm watching the waves out my window here as, a, um, as they splash, and I'm glad that they're rather low. So uh, we've dodged that. Um, very much uh, appreciate uh, all the work of everyone. Um, thanks to Dr. Etches, uh, we had a very productive uh, board meeting on Monday night and um, lots of good motions that went through. Um, and I want to thank her for her leadership on, on many of those initiatives, uh, um, particularly on the community garden and, um, uh, and all of them. They're, they're all very good in terms of keeping a balance between um, what needs to be done with physical distancing and with mental health and just in terms of overall progress. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Etches. Um, I would like to talk about um, the um, finances. Um, there's, it's it's uh, something that we're all worried about in terms of how do, we, how do we get through this, and we're looking very closely at the federal government. Um, and I appreciate that, um, that we'll have a representative talking, um, yourself, Mr. Mayor, and was it uh, Mr. Willis is going to be um, also taking the initiative on that? Sorry, on uh, which initiative? On, uh, on, on, uh, on working um, in terms of the, the federal government and, um, and working with other municipalities. Yeah, it's, it's more uh, Wendy uh, as the CFO. They have their own table. The CFOs uh, uh, meet uh, on a regular basis, so it fall more under the treasurer as opposed to Mr. Willis. But he's feeding obviously information as the, all GMs are as to what the shortfalls are uh, to Wendy. Okay. Okay. Um, I'd like to just ask a couple of questions, and I think I know the answer, but I'm just going to ask them anyway because um, this is what I get from residents, and that's fear of that um, these shortfalls will land on their shoulders. Um, one of them is um, because there's been the ticketing going on um, in parks and there are very high prices 
um, they're viewed as revenue grabs. Um, and I know there haven't been a lot of tickets, but uh, I just want to ask about what kind of revenue have they brought in and um, is that considered a revenue source? This is in terms of the parks. Um, we're hearing people getting uh, tickets for walking their dog in a park, et cetera. Is Tony uh, DeMonte there? I'm assuming it's about 50 tickets times 700, which is what, uh, $35,000? I don't think it's a lot of money in the scope of things. Tony? That's correct, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's less than 3% of the thousands of interventions we've done. And um, uh, the, uh, the fines are set by the province. It's under the provincial order. And that includes, and those, Mayor, um, those of businesses that have remained open, so not just in the parks. So um, they're, they're, it isn't very much money. You're correct. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to have that said publicly because there are there is that concern when they hear about the fines that we're trying to make up revenue, and um, I think that's very important. And overall, I think people worried um, that their property taxes are going to go up, et cetera, because they they see these reports, and uh, obviously things are different right now. Uh, one of the suggestions I have um, is uh, is talking about permanent solutions and formulas for municipalities. Currently, we have a heavy reliance on property tax, and perhaps this is an opportunity to work out something more permanently with the federal government, where we have a more fair taxation system, where they, um, they work with us um, in terms of the uh, of income tax, and that municipalities get a proportion, rather than this reliance on property taxes, which we all know is not, uh, not as fair. Um, is that going to be considered? Or can it be considered? Yeah, I think as um, you know, the Prime Minister and, and the Premier have said, everything's on the table. That table's getting bigger every day, I think, when, when people say that. Um, obviously, uh, I think we at the municipal order of government recognize um, the fact that um, we're being asked to do a disproportionately amount of heavy lifting without the tax base to cover it. Um, we haven't gone into a lot of detail about um, anything to do with, for instance, shares of income tax and so on. We've really been trying to stick to things that we have in place already, such as the gas tax and whether there's a desire and, and a willingness to um, you know, move that uh, ahead, as they did last year, where they doubled the gas tax for the one year. That helped us a lot. Uh, so you know, we're open, and I'm open to bringing other ideas. I think the problem is that, as you can imagine, both those other orders of government, like like we are, are swamped with uh, so many other uh, issues they have to deal with on an immediate sense that we really haven't had the opportunity to look longer term at uh, the fiscal arrangement or imbalance between municipalities and the province and the federal government. So I, I think, you know, everyone is uh, struggling to get through each day to minimize the, uh, the deaths and, and people uh, who are having to deal with this horrible virus. But, you know, I'll certainly take that as uh, as a, a point to bring forward at future meetings. I, I appreciate it. Um, recognizing, yes, we, we are going through tough times and uh, um, there there's a lot of that, but um, this is an opportunity to look for permanent solutions that will be more fair to taxpayers overall. So I, I hope that we'll push that agenda um, and I, I appreciate uh, that you're acknowledging that. Uh, the only other question I had is in terms of things happening in our wards, um, it's already been asked about, um, for example, when we have long-term facilities in our wards, if, uh, if we could get um, information by ward of, of things that are particularly happening, for example, a, a long care, a lo sort of long-term facility, a long-term care facility, um, is that possible that we can get uh, heads up on information that's uh, going on in our area. Dr. Etches, is that uh, yes. possible? Yes, Councillor, uh, that is underway. Uh, so an, an update went out to uh, all councillors last night, I believe, uh, to explain that uh, we appreciate you need that information to be able to respond to questions from family members and constituents. And so um, this is something that we will uh, make sure we're providing into the future. Okay, thank you very much, and I appreciate all the work that's already going on. You've been doing a great job in terms of your team uh, responding to my staff.
Um, one more thank you I want to give um, is to counselor staff because I know mine are working extremely hard from home. People don't realize that even though they're at home, they're working very long hours, and I believe that most of the counselor staff are. So I just wanted to give them a shout out as well. And uh, as you know, I've got a most. <laughs> um, I also uh, want to mention about my motion that I'm going to ask for um, if we can uh, suspend the rules uh, to extend uh, community, uh, the community shout out so we can uh, continue to thank our essential workers. Okay, we'll, we'll so. deal with that. Thank you uh, very much, right, Councillor. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Moffat, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I have no uh, comments or questions at this time. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Councillor Sons. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Likewise, uh, lots of great questions asked. Are already answering my questions, so no this questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Councillor McKenney, please. You push. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just had uh, one comment, uh, just picking up on um, some of the uh, previous comments about uh, the need for green space. And I just want to add, uh, if I can, uh, Dr. Etches, to um, what you're hearing and what I'm hearing from residents for uh, their need for green space. Um, they are looking at, you know, our approaches to relaxing those restrictions. Of course, I'm always... Uh, uh, very mindful that uh, I take uh, your direction uh, as the medical expert, and I think most people, you know, understand that and can appreciate that. But uh, just want to also pass along, um, I, you know, the the fact that you know many people don't have a yard, a backyard, and and uh, as we, you know, continue in uh, isolation, our self isolation and our you know physical distancing that. Um, people are starting to wonder about those uh, relax, you know, how we're relaxing the restrictions, um, you know, any mitigation practices, you know, more of a harm reduction approach. Um, so I just want to, I just want to add that uh, into today's discussion. I do have one question, uh, and it is on, um, and it is to uh, Dr. Etches on um, shelter residents. I know there's uh, research that's just come out of Boston uh, that I don't think would be any different to, at any shelter that showed 36% um, of people in shelter um, had uh, the COVID virus and that most were asymptomatic. Uh, so it's uh, it, 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 similar to what's happening in our long-term care homes, you know, um, to, we could see uh, easily quite a, uh, an explosion of cases in, in, um, in our shelters. And I just wondered if any of the new guidance from the ministry is looking at, again, um, testing everyone in shelter uh, to ensure that people, um, you know, who are asymptomatic, who aren't showing uh, signs, are, you know, are being uh, isolated uh, out of the uh, out of the group. Thank you for your question, Councillor. Um, I, I agree with your assessment that shelters are are similar in in some ways to long term care homes, uh, where it's difficult for people to uh, be self isolating and uh, where there's a higher risk of transmission of COVID-19. And so um, it, it is a priority to be able to uh, provide alternatives for people and to, um, to look at measures to control infection transmission. Uh, the, the ministry guidance that came out last night uh, was fairly specific to long-term care homes, but it did contain language about scaling up this kind of response to retirement homes and, um, and we have heard uh, you know previously the ministry talking about congregate care settings more broadly so including shelters or, or uh, group homes or hospices so um, from a Ottawa public health point of view uh, we are taking a similar view of the risk and considering what is needed um, we do need to have a coordinated approach uh, to testing uh, across the region. Uh, the volume of testing needs to be carefully managed so that um, 
we are able to process the priority tests uh, of people who uh, really need that result uh, for a clinical uh, management. Uh, or um, So, uh, you know, I, I think um, I understand why the province uh, spoke about long-term care homes first, uh, because that is where we are seeing, uh, unfortunately, death. Uh, and, um, and we will uh, continue to, to understand that guidance and, and think about the way forward, as well as making sure the most important practices to decrease transmission are in place, um, you know, uh, regardless of a one point in time uh, testing approach, uh, we just need to have that ongoing protection for communities. Okay, so uh, just so I understand then that the, you know, that it is on your radar, it is something that, um, and I, you know, obviously what's happening in long-term care homes uh, today is, is immediate, but uh, just to ensure that it's it's on our radar, that we understand that uh, we could see the same thing uh, happen uh, in our in our shelter. So I do. I thank you for that. Um, yeah. And that's the only question I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Councillor Brockington, please. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, and good afternoon to you and everyone. Um, I guess I'll start with a question of the city manager. Uh, two weeks ago at our last council meeting, I asked a question about once the state of emergency is lifted by the province of Ontario, how locally we will make decisions to start to reopen our city across, across the city. And today I heard Dr. Etches briefly touch upon criteria that she wants to be uh, reviewing before decisions are made, uh, the decrease in hospitalizations, that the healthcare system has, you know, an expanded ability to test, that we're able to basically infiltrate hot spots throughout the city and provide them with support so there's no spread. Just touched upon schools and workplaces, but at the end of the day, I'm trying to understand who's in charge, who makes the final decision locally in Ottawa about how we start to reopen and are there other criteria being used to factor into that equation because for me that's still a bit murky and I just wanted to have clarification uh, today. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, I'll start and uh, Dr. Etches can, uh, can add her comment. Um, the, the direction that ultimately we're going to get is from the uh, province, I think, right. as they start announcing um, uh, changes to their emergency order and, and uh, relaxation of social distances, their definition of what essential services are and uh, what they believe can open, you know, in terms of priority. And the Premier has been, you know, speaking a little bit about that in advance, and we know that they're planning that, and we know from our... I've been on conversations with uh, senior uh, federal uh, public servants at the deputy minister level where they're looking at that too. Um, and what they're very interested in is, is what's happening locally so they can feed that into their, um, their decision-making process and, and how they're going to communicate that. And of course, locally, uh, Dr. Etches is, is, um, is uh, going to be advising um, our team in terms of uh, how we support businesses from a service perspective, but then she has a role as medical officer of health in terms of uh, what local um, what local advice she's going to be giving uh, businesses and city services in terms of how we open. And that's why we set up those uh, task forces. Once we, we understand, we're starting to think about it in anticipation of what the announcements may be from the provincial government. Uh, and that's why we have public health engaged in our uh, recovery task team, which is uh, led by Dr. Uh, uh, by uh, sorry, by Mr. Willis and Dr. Etches is uh, is uh, and her team will be participating in that. And of course, Dr. Etches is on the emergency operations control group and is our key advisor in terms of uh, the decisions we make and the actions we take on a daily basis. So, Dr. Etches, do you want to uh, add anything to that? Uh, just uh, appreciate that we do have uh, excellent uh, relationships across uh, different sectors involved. Um, so, uh, you know, the way we work is collaborative and, and we'll be working uh, to make decisions together. Um, the other sector that's involved uh, clearly is the healthcare sector. Uh, so, working with um, 
leaders in, in the healthcare community because that's one of the, the key variables is how they're doing, uh, what their capacity is, and um, they also run the testing. Um, so, so just to, to confirm, um, the, the main uh, parameters will be set by the province and, and we'll work on implementing what makes sense in Ottawa. Uh, and I will have Ottawa uh, first and foremost, in terms of protecting lives uh, here um, in mind, that, that is uh, the responsibility that I have. And uh, so we'll use local evidence and local data also to inform, um, you know, the response. When this first started about five weeks ago, the immediate concerns about preparation were, do we have enough PPE? Do we have enough hospital capacity? Do we have enough ICU capacity? And when talks then evolved to when we're going to open up, we wanted to make sure those initial concerns were dealt with so that if there was a second wave, we would be prepared and ready. And so as part of the discussions, I'm, we want to ensure that any type of reopening lessens risk as much as possible, that we have good strategies in place. So I'm just evolving to my next question, that is when businesses start to reopen, uh, in whole or in part, small businesses, medium, large, and if school is still out, if we don't do this um, complementing one another, meaning reopen schools and businesses at the same time, how will families and parents who have parents that go back to work have care for their children? Um, and maybe the plan ultimately is to reopen both at the same time. Maybe June 1st schools will reopen. I don't know. But as much as I want to see businesses open, and trust me, I do, um, the other main part is, well, what do we do with children who aren't in school? So I assume that's being looked at. Mr. Mayor, it's Steve Willis. If I could answer that question, uh, the Economic Recovery Task Force absolutely has that specific item on our task list to try to reach out to the province to get more direction. Uh, as the city manager said, those decisions rest with the province, and we certainly have we share the councillors' concerns, and it is one of those factors that we do uh, need to figure out uh, as we try to get the economy up and humming again. Okay, thank you. And um, just going back to Dr. Etch, as I heard, uh, you state more than once that you would have liked to have had an additional thousand people join OPH temporarily at least to help with trace testing and to do that very specific testing so that once we start to reopen, we can mitigate new cases and stop the spread right away. Has there been any progress? Do you still need that number of staff? Have you added new staff? Are you as prepared as you can be so that when we reopen, you have what you need? Thank you for the question. Uh, the City of Ottawa has definitely helped us with redeploying staff to Ottawa Public Health. 75% uh, of all our staff are involved directly in the COVID response. And of all the people working on the COVID response uh, under Ottawa Public Health, 30% are from the city. And that's about 140 people right now. Um, the projections to require 1,000 uh, case managers have been modified uh, because the increase in the number of cases has slowed down. Uh, and so we aren't projecting the same demand. Uh, and so we are uh, modifying that down. Um, and it, it will depend on the provincial testing strategy. Uh, if we're able to test more, that's more results then we need to follow up on. So our estimates of what we need into the future are less reliable the further out we go. Uh, right. But right now we are coping, we are managing, we have um, added to the team and they are uh, d you know, doing the training and, and adding the supervisors and, and supports so that um, nurses who have joined us from the Registered nu Nurses Association of Ontario you know, over 100 um, students who have joined us, that they're all, um, you know, becoming case managers and, and experts uh, in this public health work. Um, that, that is underway. Thank you, Doctor. And just finally, uh, going back to the finance side, if, if the largest revenue shortfall right now is from the loss or lack of revenues from public transit, 
why are we not taking more stronger efforts to reduce costs at OC Transpo to help offset that lost revenue? Uh, may I ask uh, John, because we've been looking at that, John, to comment on uh, what the findings have been on that? So, uh, Mr. Mayor, the, uh, what we're doing right now is we have staff resources set up to maintain the services that we've got right now, and, and the service, even at the reduced level, is critical and is being used by all those essential workers uh, that are uh, supporting the community. Uh, with proper spacing, so we do have that social distancing uh, that's required. And that is the other element of our strategy is also that we do have, as you know, people that have either been infected by COVID or in isolation or self-isolation um, and normal sick leave and so forth. So the rosters that we have right now are sustaining the service. Um, so while, yes, there are operators, for example, that are on alternate shifts, um, it's uh, to preserve the capacity of the system and make sure that we can sustain it uh, through the difficult period that we're going through right now. On the fleet and facility side of things, there is more work than we even have resources for, so much so that we've brought in contracted services. We have enhanced cleaning that's required. We have uh, maintenance inspections that have to be kept up to date and so forth. So uh, there's, um, uh, you know, uh, the mechanics staff, fleet staff, uh, they've uh, they've stepped up and are literally working all their shifts, and all we've been managed to do is do staggered shifts. The shifts there. Uh, in terms of looking forward, I know you've heard TransLink and other agencies in uh, in Canada are doing massive layoffs in that area. Uh, uh, Vancouver specifically has announced massive operator layoffs. Uh, that comes with corresponding reduction in service, drastic res reductions in services. Um, and uh, the, uh, the fact of the matter on that is that they have a different funding source there, uh, but also um, the cost to lay off and maintain the provisions of collecting bargaining rights and recall and so forth. Uh, as you found out during uh, a very bad strike many uh, years ago, 11 years ago now, um, everybody thinks you save money, but ramping down and then re-ramping up, recertifying everybody, making sure your inspections are up to date and retraining everyone. Uh, the costs outweigh the benefits, particularly with all of the variables that we have right now where we don't know what return to normal date is. We are planning, as the city manager has talked about, in terms of potential dates. Um, and um, uh, we, we're putting all those variables into play. So it's a very complicated uh, scenario. I know on the surface it seems like we could save millions of dollars. We are, as, uh, as Wendy, the treasurer, pointed out on uh, where we can, reduced overtime uh, and those things and, and cutting off uh, certain things that we can do. But it's about preserving the social distancing, providing the critical services that we have right now. And as some of the councillors know, we've had to add trips. Uh, and we also supplement uh, the rail operations. We're sustaining that with operators and so forth. So, Mr. Mayor, I, I don't know if that uh, answers all the elements of that question. I, I appreciate the reply, um, Mr. Manconi, and uh, thanks, staff, for the presentation today and uh, everything else that's going on. So thank you. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Leeper, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a few questions for uh, Ms. Stevenson with respect to the tax deferrals. Her presentation uh, noted the drag on finances uh, arising from those uh, half a million dollars if it goes till June, 2.1, 2.7 in December. Uh, what does that represent? Are we assuming that some of those tax deferrals come in? So that's basically um, the lost investment income that we uh, will not see or not have in terms of the deferrals that we're approving. Um, so as it stands, typically when the money comes in, um, the city will invest that until it's required. So what you're seeing reported in the slide deck is basically um, the pieces that we can't invest, so it's lost interest income to the city, and also some lost user fees um, associated with the services that we provide. Okay. So, in, uh, what is the what is the overall uh, amount of taxes that have been deferred to date? So, as of the beginning of this week, 
we were almost close to 700 uh, approved applications and approximately $6.6 .6 million in taxes. As you know, uh, the applications are open until the end of July. We expect to see more that will come in through our final billing period, and uh, we'll certainly report out on that. Okay. And do you have any insight as to uh, the breakdown between commercial and residential on those deferred taxes? Um, I do have the breakdown, Councillor, and if you don't mind, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but I can circle back and share that with you. Okay. Um, the, the commercial taxes, as we've spoken a few times about, uh, are of uh, particular interest to me. Uh, there are still landlords who are playing hardball with their commercial tenants, which I don't think serves uh, anyone's best interest, but there it is. Uh, one of the things the Council on that front was um, very uh, deliberate about doing was to uh, require that commercial tax deferrals uh, flow through to the tenants. Do we have any indication at this early stage as to whether or not that is actually happening? Are you fielding any phone calls from uh, from the tenants in your office? No, I have not heard of any. Okay. Um, and it's probably too soon to tell. Um, and then finally, with respect to property values, I know I asked maybe a couple ago, but long-term this uh, pandemic may or may not have an effect on um, assessment values for both commercial and residential. I'm hearing about uh, a continued hot residential um, housing market in Westboro, which uh, uh, is encouraging uh, in terms of being able to sustain residential property taxes. But do we have an idea of at this point, what are the analysts saying about commercial property values and whether or not that's something we need to take into consideration as we look out for a couple of years of, uh, of forecasts? Uh, it's a good question, Councillor. It's something that we really don't have an eye to in terms of what that future forecast is going to look like. What we know today is that uh, the assessment, so our four-year cycle assessment, was pushed an additional year. So that means that uh, any residential or non-res property will have the same value um, in 2021 as it did in 2020. Uh, the only piece I think that's interesting here is the fact that the assessment values for the next cycle will be based on January 1st, 2019, uh, unless there's changes to that. But that is the date that was chosen by the province. Um, so it's really a question in terms of um, how the province looks at this going forward and if they make any changes to that. Okay, it's, uh, it's something we'll need to keep an eye on and um, uh, certainly if you're talking and, and Mayor, if you're chatting with um, commercial property owners, uh, I have been grateful to hear from a lot of them that they're working with their tenants. We don't see a main that is uh, a lot of vacant stores in September, but uh, I do think we need to reiterate uh, with those landlords that it serves everyone's best interest to work with the work with the tenants and make sure the doors reopen in September. Uh, Mayor, that's what I have. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a very good point, and I think that's why we're we're working uh, with the treasurer's office to ensure that if if a big landlord is going to uh, get a a break uh, by deferring their taxes, that then that should be trickled down to the local shopkeeper as well. So I appreciate that, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Harder, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I just wanted to say that uh, all the kudos that have um, I've heard before from other colleagues uh, to our staff are uh, well deserved. But um, uh, and lots of good questions asked. So rather than ask a question, I would just like to uh, put a shout out to all of the residents uh, and businesses in our city who are doing a fabulous job. Um, doing their very best to uh, play by today's new rules, hoping for, um, you know, the day when uh, we can start uh, easing some of the restrictions. Uh, I haven't really left Barhaven, uh, you know, I haven't had the need to and I haven't made it up an excuse to, uh, but I can see how very hard people in our city are trying their best. And I just want to uh, say thank you very much. Uh, keep up the good work and hopefully we'll start to see some restrictions um, ease up in the near future. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you, Councillor Harder. Councillor King, please. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I'd like to echo the same sentiments of, uh, of Councillor Harder. Uh, many of my questions have been actually addressed uh, by uh, the rest of my colleagues, so I really appreciate that. And I do want to, as well, uh, really uh, acknowledge the, the hard work of city staff uh, across the board, especially around the Human Needs Task Force. Uh, there's been a lot of response to a lot of inquiries from my office uh, surrounding especially uh, food security, and, and we'll continue to, to work on that. Uh, uh, since my ward has some of the highest uh, usage of, of food banks in the province even before this uh, uh, this crisis had emerged, and now we're seeing uh, uh, those rates increase by 25 to 30 percent. So uh, we're, we're really um, uh, gratified by the response of the Human Needs Task Force, and we're also gratified by the work of the Economic Task Force because we're seeing a lot of challenges with small business, and we'll want to work with small businesses to ensure their, their viability in the future after uh, this crisis uh, subsides. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you, Councillor King. And uh, last but not least, from beautiful Alta Vista, Councillor Cloutier. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Merci énormément. Uh, I have no questions. All my questions have been asked, and I, I thank uh, Dr. Etchez for her continued leadership and uh, Steve Kanalakis and all the general managers for the presentation and for the information we got. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to, um, uh, on Monday, we had an Ottawa Board of Health meeting. I want to thank the citizen board members who serve on the Board of Health uh, for their their work um, in, uh, it during this and uh, during the meeting on Monday. Mr. Mayor, that's all from me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cloutier. Okay, so uh, reports rising directly to Council. Rapport présenté directement au Conseil. Uh, Ward 19 Cumberland vacancy options. Uh, Councillor Luloff and uh, DeRuz have a motion. Uh, if you would like to introduce um, the motion, Councillor Luloff, and then um, we'll open it up for questions. I don't believe there's a, a presentation. It's pretty straightforward. It's giving us a little bit more runway to determine uh, uh, what's going to happen with obviously the, the COVID situation. And uh, the clerk, I believe, is on the line if people do have questions. So we'll go down the list of everyone, but we'll start off by asking Councillor Luloff uh, to put the motion on the table, please. Thank you very much. Uh, obviously, this isn't uh, an ideal situation uh, for a by-election. Uh, you know, I've gone through the report and consulted with the city clerk to bring forward this motion, as in my opinion, the first option to defer the decision to fill the vacancy is the optimal way forward, uh, which allows council to retain its decision power as it relates to filling the, vac uh, the vacancy by either appointing or by way of a by-election until such time as OPH and staff are in a better position to assess the safe way forward. Uh, this option uh, allows at this time for the greatest amount of flexibility and minimizes risks given the ongoing nature of the COVID-19 emergency in our community. Myself, uh, Councillor DeRuz and Councillor Dudas will continue to support um, and cover off duties in Ward 19 to ensure that constituency matters are addressed and residents have a voice at Council. Uh, of note, Ward 19's office uh, still remains open for uh, Ward 19 residents uh, with service requests and that sort of thing. Further, staff have uh, agreed to bring back a report uh, for council consideration no later than 30 days after the lifting of the provincial declaration of emergency. I believe everybody uh, has received this motion, therefore I will just read the uh, therefore be it resolved. Par conséquent, il est résolu que le conseil municipal rapporte la décision car cela be it result that City Council deferred the decision on how to fill the vacancy in Ward 19, meaning whether to appoint or enact a by-election bylaw under uh, Section 263 of the Municipal Act 2001 until such time as there is further information available on when the end of the emergency might be expected and that a report be brought to Council on this matter no later than 30 days after the Provincial Emergency Declaration order is lifted. Merci, uh, Conseiller. Thank you, Councillor. And that's seconded by Councillor De Roos. Just um, to see if anyone has any questions. Uh, Councillor Elshantiri. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, no question at this time. Thank you. Councillor Egli. 
I have one quick question for the clerk, if he's on the line, Mr. Mayor. He is, yes. Um, so, uh, Mr. O'Connor, assuming things do not go as well as we all hope they go, and there's a delay in the lifting of, of restrictions at the provincial level, uh, and keeping in mind that we, we have to um, fill this position at some point so the, the good people of the ward can have representation, how much time would you need in those circumstances to set up an appointment-type process similar, for example, to what they've done at the school board uh, in, in previous years when there's been openings and they haven't gone to a full election? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's uh, Rick O'Connor. We'd probably be looking at the 30-day uh, to 45-day period. To set it up and, and, and hold it in, in, in totality? 30 days, sorry, to set it up. So 30 to 45 days to set it up and then implement it. Okay, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Okay, thank, thank you, Councillor Eglai. Councillor Tierney? Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Real brief, quick question. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, um, typically an election cycle 75 days, I believe, if, if that's correct. Is there any opportunity to ask a request from the province a shorter election cycle just to make sure we can actually have an election uh, mr. mayor no I don't I don't think there's that opportunity I think the province has been uh, with their emergency orders clear that we can uh, action these matters ourselves as we need to and we also have as the members will remember from the report we have certain emergency powers in the Municipal Elections Act as well great no further questions thank you great uh, thank you Councillor. Councillor Gower please I have no questions on this item. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor DeRuz. No question, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Councillor Fleury. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Hubley. No, uh, no questions on this, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Councillor Menard. Uh, no, good motion, thanks. Councillor Dudas. No, I support this, thank you. Councillor Meehan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just one quick question. Can someone remind me of the population of Cumberland? Sorry, what was that? The population of Cumberland Ward? Yes. Uh, I can tell you, Mr. Mayor, off the top that we have about 33,500 voters. We'll, uh, we'll have a quick look at the total amount uh, shortly. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Luloff? Councillor Cavanaugh? Yes, I support. Councillor Cavanaugh? Yes, thank you. Uh, no further questions. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Moffat? Moffat? Councillor Moffat? All Co good. Okay. Councillor Suns? No questions. Thank you. Councillor McKinney? No questions. Thank you. Councillor Brockington? Uh, no question, just a comment. One, I support this. I do think it's wise to have a deferral until we have a better idea of what we can or cannot do safely. My only comment, <clears throat> excuse me, would be that um, it's my strong um, uh, support for a by-election. If it's safe to do so, I think that's the route we should be headed. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Leeper? No, I've been supporting this. Thanks, Mayor. Councillor Harder? I'm fine with this, please. Councillor King. Uh, no questions, Mr. Mayor. Merci, Conseil Cloutier. Merci, Monsieur le Maire. Aucune question. D'accord. So we have a motion before us, uh, moved by Councillor Luloff, seconded by Councillor DeRuz. Uh, carried. 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 Okay. Any dissents? Carried. Any dissents? No? Okay. Uh, next, uh, Planning Committee report, rapport uh, numéro 22, de Comité de l'Urbanisme, Modification Règlement de Zonage 287 uh, Rue Lisger. 287 Lisger. On the report. Mr. Mayor, if I could uh, make a comment. Yeah, Councillor McKenney, go ahead. Ward Councillor. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I spoke to this also at Planning Committee, so I, I, won't, uh, I won't be long, but uh, just want to 
uh, register that uh, I'm, I'm not in favor of the zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, it may seem like it's uh, not a lot of extra public parking in the downtown uh, with 28 uh, new parking spots. Uh, however, uh, this was not included in the original site plan and um, the same applicant was uh, granted a very similar zoning bylaw amendment uh, over just a couple blocks over um, on Gloucester and uh, an Nepean for a 253 space garage. So uh, at this time, it's unfortunate as a city, we don't look at the aggregate effect of uh, parking. We only do it uh, one off. Um, but, uh, you know, the more public parking we continue to add into the downtown, um, you know, the more it undermines. Um, our um, transportation master plan um, and, and uh, our uh, ability to, um, you know, shift our, uh, our uh, modal share to uh, active and healthy transportation, including transit. So um, I, uh, I want to register that and uh, would uh, um, ask uh, my colleagues to uh, turn down this uh, this application. Thank you. Okay, and Councillor Harder is the chair of the committee. Comment? Well, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to say that um, Councillor McKenney raised the uh, issue of them getting an exception um, a couple of blocks over, and uh, one of the staff at the meeting said that that was not um, was not uh, the case. Uh, whether it is or not, uh, staff are supporting this, and. Uh, uh, the committee, uh, with one exception, I believe, um, planning committee voted for uh, this um, um, addition of um, adding the uh, parking uh, as a permitted use. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, if, if I may, if, if I may, um, staff didn't indicate that it wasn't the case. What they indicated was they don't look at. Uh, the aggregate effect, so they don't consider what's happening a block over. So I just want to make sure that that's uh, that's made clear. And if we want to ask staff for their opinion on that, that's uh, that's uh, fine with me too. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we have a, a recommendation from planning committee uh, before us uh, carried. A dissent by Councillor McKenney. Dissent by Councillor King. Dissent as well. King. Leeper. Menard Slurry. Menard. Dissent. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Kavanaugh. Yeah. Uh, numéro 5, uh, modification, uh, changement de modification de plan. Uh, change uh, modification to official plan amendment number 136 regarding minimum building heights in Canada Town Centre. Plan amendment number 136 regarding minimal, minimum, excuse me, building heights in Canada Town Centre. Carried. Carried. Does anyone Carried. have a, Carried. any dissents on item five? Okay. Next is uh, numéro six, uh, modification du règlement de zonage 20. Zoning bylaw amendment 25 Grant Street. 25 Grant Street. Carried. Uh, a comment, uh, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Leeper, go ahead. You're the Thank ward you, councillor. Um, I am asking colleagues to reject the staff uh, recommendation on this one. There is a process right now, um, which we're just calling the R4 study, that is taking a look at the zoning in the R4 areas and recommending significant increases in density. Uh, one of the assurances that we've had from staff as a community that those uh, is that the increases in density aren't going to result in increases in the size of the built form. Uh, staff have been clear that they want to hold the line on um, how large the buildings get and, and have been relatively specific in the recommendations that they've made to date that we want to uh, increase the density without changing the performance standards in a really significant way. The 25 Grant Street application is in uh, one of the junior R4 areas in the city. It is um, uh, right now capped at four units. The application is to make it eight units. The Hinton
Eisenberg Community Association and myself are not objecting to the increase in density. We recognize that the R4 study is going to lead to the kind of increase in density that uh, is being sought in this application. But what I think we are very concerned about is that as one of the very first applications uh, moving through um, in the new R4 reality of increased unit counts is that the building performance uh, standards are not being adhered to. Uh, on principle, I think it's really important if you if you want to get the support of urban councillors for the increase in and for the urban communities for increased density, we have to know that the performance standards for the built form are, are not going to be a new floor from which greater um, uh, building heights, building uh, footprints are going to start. It's not a negotiating spot. So um, as one of the very first applications that's moving through uh, the system in this new increased density R4, um, I am objecting to this and I'm going to ask my colleagues to object to this on the basis that we are already fiddling with the performance standards when um, a hard line on performance standards is mitigations that is being held out by the city to temper the effects of the greater density. Thank you, Chair. Great. Thank you, Councillor Harder, as uh, Chair of the Committee that brought forward the recommendation. Well, um, I'm aware of uh, Councillor Leeper's position. And I would suggest that if Mr. James or uh, Mr. Willis are on the phone that they could respond to this. Um, this is um, minor, uh, very minor. Uh, one of the issues that was raised was really a, will be dealt with a site plan on, uh, on the driveway. Um, and the exterior stairs, the, the difference in the um, permission is um, less, than, uh, less than a meter. And committee uh, supported uh, this um, eight-unit, uh, um, three-story um, infill project. Uh, Mr. Willis, uh, uh, Mr. James, do you have uh, any yes, comments? Mr. Mayor, it's Steve. It, it's Steve. I'll start, and then I'll turn over to Doug. It, just go back to Councillor Leeper's comments. So while I understand the concerns, this application does predate the new rules. It is not, with the new rules are not yet in effect. And so under the Planning Act, we are legally obligated to consider the application with the policies that are in effect today and really assess whether the impacts being requested are minor in nature. Um, and, and that's, we have to work with the rule book that exists today and staff's recommendation was based on the fact that the, the changes are, are consistent with the direction we're going and minor in nature. However, I understand the comment that Councillor Leeper has raised about the R4 study separate from this file. I have committed to Councillor Leeper that I will discuss with staff uh, official plan policies to, uh, to deal with that very specific concern about floor versus ceiling uh, in, the, in the official plan, either the draft official plan or perhaps even before that when we bring R4 forward. But I have to separate out this application from that future report to Council on R4. And I'll just conclude by asking Mr. Uh, James to comment on the minor nature and the basis of the staff recommendation. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. It's uh, Doug James here. Um, with respect to the proposal, the staff did evaluate it and, uh, with respect to the policies of the official plan uh, for intensification. Uh, we found that the uh, nature of the variances or the there were performance standards uh, uh, for the subject property uh, did meet uh, the intent of those policies and that it was a uh, good infill. Um, lots of green space on the, um, uh, on the property as a whole. It is providing two parking spaces. Um, there was an issue with, with respect to the stairs um, on the, one of the side yards. The stairs are allowed in the side yard uh, and through the site plan control process, the issue of the stairs with uh, the screening of those uh, from the uh, neighboring property. We can look at that to mitigate uh, the impact of those stairs um, as well as with respect to the parking, there was an issue to Mr. Mayor um, with the permeability um, for surface water runoff and uh, because that is an issue that uh, uh, is within um, Kitchissippi Ward uh, but through the site plan control process that too will also be looked at. So in total we found that the proposal uh, did meet the official plan policies and represented good infill. Okay, so uh, we have a recommendation from committee for 25 Grant Street, modification de règlement de zonage 25 rue Grant. Uh, carried. Yes and nays. Yes and nays have been called. Sorry, 
yeas and nays have been called. So uh, this is uh, the committee recommendation. Uh, if you support the committee recommendation, it's yes. If you don't, it's no. Councillor El Shantiri. Yes. Councillor Eglai. Yes. Councillor Tierney. Yes. Councillor Gower. Yes. Councillor Derouze. Yes. Conseil Fleury. No. Councillor Hubley. Yes. Councillor Menard. No. Councillor Dudas. Yes. Councillor Meehan. Yes. Councillor Shirelli, Councillor Luloff. Yes. Councillor Kavanaugh. No. Councillor Moffat. Yes. Councillor Suds. Yes. Councillor McKinney. No. Councillor Brockington. Yes. Councillor Leeper. Uh, no. Councillor Deans. Councillor Harder. Yes. Councillor King. No. Conseil Clouchy? Oui. Mayor Watson? Oui. 15 yeas, 6 nays. Okay, so that item carries. Uh, next item is bulk consent agenda. We have uh, a request to remove item number E. Does anyone else wish to remove anything from the bulk consent agenda? So on the bulk consent agenda, uh, minus item E, carried. No. Carried. Okay. Any dissents? Any dissents? So, Councillor uh, Fleury, um, you have a uh, technical amendment seconded by Councillor Harder. If you'd like to uh, introduce it, please. Councillor Fleury. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a, uh, a motion brought forward by staff, uh, whereas Planning Committee at its meeting of April 9, 2020, approved the following recommendations in respect to report. ACS 2020 PI PS 004 title City Resolution for 263 Greensway Avenue. That planning committee recommend to council that by declaring a declaration of resolution under section 45 of the Planning Act, an application to the committee of adjustment be permitted in respect to the property at 263 Green Greensway Avenue for minor variances associated with the proposed development limited to the number of parking spaces permitted and whereas it has come to staff's attention that the disposition section of this report had not been completed therefore be it resolved that council approve the addition of the following text as the report's disposition the office of the city clerk will communicate council's decision to the property owner be it further resolved that pursuant to the planning act subsection 3417 no further notice be given Okay, uh, on the uh, amendment, carried. carried. Any dissents? On the motion as amended, carried. Carried. Any dissents? Okay, thank you, merci. Uh, Councillor Moffat, uh, motion to adopt reports, motion portant adoption de rapport, seconded by Councillor Dudas, please. and the reports from the city clerk entitled Ward 19 Cumberland Vacancy Options and Summary of Oral or Written Submissions for items subject to the Planning Act explanation requirements at the City Council meeting of April 8, 2020 be received and adopted as amended. On the motion, carried. Adopt A. Carried. carried. Any, dis any dissents? No? Okay. Uh, next, uh, motions of which notice have been previously given. Motion dont avis a été donné entièrement. Uh, we have uh, Councillor Tierney uh, moving this, seconded by Councillor Duda. So, Councillor Tierney, if you'd like to introduce your motion, please. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, whereas Blair Road between Meadowbrook Road and Innes Road is currently a congested two lane roadway and a major north south arterial road in the east end, whereas approximately 430 buses. Um, uh, to and from Blair LRT station headed along the south 
uh, of Blair Road currently travel in mixed traffic, which causes delays and congestion, uh, whereas the widening of Blair Road to establish uh, transit priority lanes support the city's strategic objective to deliver sustainable transportation investment, improve transit services, and increase transit ridership, whereas the plan for the Blair Road widening is included in the Brian Colburn uh, Cumberland Transit Way um, environmental assessment, whereas the city is committed to complete the Brian Colbert Cumberland Transitway EA study to resolve the urgent commuting needs of residents in the growing East End urban community, whereas Brian Colbert Cumberland Transitway project is more complex and largely the relatively straightforward Blair Road widening project, whereas the complete EA is required prior to implementing any of these major transportation projects whereas uh, separating the two studies would position the Blair Road Transit Priority Project to be ready for implementation sooner would not constitute uh, piecemealing in accordance with the Environmental Act of Ontario, whereas carrying out the Blair Road Widening Project as a separate EA study requires approval from Transportation Committee. Therefore, it be resolved that staff would be directed to separate the Blair Road Widening for Transit Priority EA study from the Brian Colburn uh, Cumberland Transitway EA study so that the Blair Road portion uh, becomes a standalone project and EA study be a further resolved uh, that uh, Blair Road widening EA study assesses options for combined uh, transit HOV uh, lanes to address the pedestrian and cycling infrastructure to the Blair Road LRT station and just to uh, to wrap it up Mr. Mayor um, this road is essentially uh, like a rural road uh, it's a it, it's a major pinch point for all of our all our uh, uh, bus movements, as well as it's very very unsafe uh, for pedestrians. There's uh, no sidewalk, so it's uh, quite dangerous. Uh, this is staff supported, and I will reiterate, this is not queue jumping. And I'll certainly uh, expect uh, staff will uh, also make mention of that. And I have consulted very heavily with the East End Cycling Groups. They're very excited about this. This will actually fix a major issue as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Um, does anyone else wish to speak to um, this motion? So we have a move by Councillor. Uh, Sorry? Questions? Yep, questions, Councillor Leeper. Yeah, okay, Councillor Leeper, go ahead. We have um, uh, Vivi Chi is on the line if you have any technical questions. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I, I think the key question I have is, is why now we have a transportation committee meeting coming up uh why is this being brought as a, a motion to council without uh, without a staff report is uh, councillor tierney do you want to answer or, or miss chi or mr willis sorry councillor tierney did you want to answer uh, the question it's your motion uh, certainly, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we've been working with staff for quite a period of time on this, uh, along with uh, Councillor Dudas as well. The real problem uh, uh, is that we really see here is the Brian Kohlberg uh, project. Uh, as we know, there's some NCC challenges and things that are happening. And in regards to Transportation Committee, certainly I would have loved to see this be there. Uh, but, uh, but there are a lot of things happening at the same time here. And to delay this by a few months would take away from... Uh, obviously we have some timings coming up in regards to the, tra the uh, TMP as well and this all kind of fits together but uh, I'll ask Vivi uh, if she can find the unmute button to comment on this. Oh hello. Um, so this is a motion so it doesn't require a staff report. This work is already underway and it's combined with another study so we're just doing an administrative splitting of the two files. That's all that this uh, uh, that's required here, so the motion is appropriate and doesn't require a staff report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Leeper, anything else? Yeah, so the, the piecemealing piece is uh, something I'm interested in. It's, um, uh, I am new to the concept of piecemealing the EAs. I'm wondering if I can get a description of what would not be allowed and in whose opinion um, this proposed approach doesn't constitute piecemealing. Mr. Mayor, um, piecemealing is when you do one project independent of another, but, but then it would affect the outcome of the other study. We've looked at this. The Brian Coburn all comes into uh, to Blair at the south end at Innes. There are no other options, and that's what we've been looking at. 
sorry, there, you know, that's, that's, if we're going up to the north, there could be other options looking further south. But what we're doing here with this project with, for Blair Road Station transit priority does not impact on the outcome of, an, of other works. And that's where, um, so that's why we've concluded that it's not piecemealing. Because through the EA Act, Ontario EA Act, um, the idea is to, the, the, the reason behind it is if you have a project, you have to look at all of the impacts rather than breaking them up into um, little compartments or separate projects, which then you don't see the overall cumulative effects. Whereas in this case, it's, we don't see that happening at all because they are very independent of each other and they can work together as well. So in November 2019, um, the EAA was expanded to go from Meadowbrook to Blair. And that makes a lot of intuitive sense to me since you're going to want to adopt the same kind of uh, profile on the street, um, understand the impacts from uh, the one end to the other. Why can't we study just the Meadowbrook to Innes without understanding the implications for the Meadowbrook to Blair Station. Surely those are linked. Uh, yes, they're together, and it is. We're trying to get everything from uh, on Blair from Innes all the way through to make the connection up to the transit um, station at Blair, the LRT station. So shouldn't that be studied as as a single process? So, um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Councillor um, Tierney, do you have a comment about that? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm taken aback by this question because I think that they're, they're together within the same area, are they not? Yes, that, that is correct. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Jeff, I'm, I failed to understand what your question is. Uh, are you talking about the connectivity right to the station all the way through? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and as, as a matter of fact, uh, there has been a lot of work done on that as well, especially on top of the bridge that goes over top of the highway. A lot of those lane re reconfigurations are a part of uh, a lot of the discussions that have taken place to date. Uh, it is very dangerous right now for cyclists going over top of that bridge, and certainly that is uh, one of the objectives of this Blair Road connector. Okay, anything else, Councillor Leeper? Okay. No, Mayor, I'll, um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay. So on uh, the motion by Councillor uh, Tierney, signed by Councillor uh, Dudas, carried? Carried. Carried. Any, carried. Dis any dissents? Okay. Uh, next is uh, motions requiring suspension of the rules of procedure. Motion exigeant la suspension des règles de procédure. Uh, the first item we have is uh, Councillor Dudas, seconded by Councillor DeRuz, uh, a procedural matter. Uh, so on suspension, carried. Carried. Dissents? So Councillor uh, Dudas, do you want to um, just, uh, I guess, read the therefore be it resolved, because I think everyone has a copy of it, and uh, Tim Mark is available to answer any questions. Councillor? Certainly, Mr. Mayor. Uh, therefore, it be resolved that the Council approve the following additional amendments to Procedure Bylaw Number 2019-8 to remain in effect while the emergency declaration set out in order in Council 518-2020 remains in effect. Number one, more than two regular meetings of Standing Committee Commission may be cancelled if, in the Chair's opinion, such meetings are not necessary for the proper conduct of the business of the Committee Commission or convened as special meetings as provided for in Council Motion 31 of March 25, 2020, and number two, that the means of electronic participation for future meetings of Council and Committee Commission may be by telephone or other electronic means as may be communicated to members and the public in advance of the meeting, including the process for members of the public to participate electronically Committee Commission meetings by means of written and or oral submission. Okay, thank you. Um, any uh, questions by members of council? So on the motion. Mr. Mayor, I have a, I have a question. Sorry, Councillor Fleury, go Mr. ahead. 
Um, so I wonder, the previous item is a good example of, you know, it, there are probably no issues, but it would have been nice to get a, a presentation. And I listen in to, um, I'm not a member of planning committee, but thought that planning committee was quite uh, effective meeting virtually last week. And I wonder, uh, obviously it, it's pending uh, resources, but uh, if we can work with the clerk to try to meet as as regularly as possible virtually, which has appeared to be effective uh, for planning committee, for example. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point, and I think that's part of uh, item two on the recommendation. So thank you for that. Uh, so on the motion, carried. Any carried. dissents? Sorry. The next motion requiring suspension of the rules is moved by Councillor Harder, seconded by Councillor El Shantiri with respect to the committee of adjustment and their uh, duty to um, carry on meeting. So on suspension, carried. Carried. Any dissents? So, uh, Councillor Harder, do you want to introduce your uh, motion, please, on the Committee of Adjustment? Certainly, Mr. Mayor, and uh, earlier today in our inbox, uh, coincidentally, we received a note from the um, Committee of Adjustment um, telling us about the situation they were in during a state of provincial emergency. So what this does is um, it, uh, because uh, they haven't been able to operate and they haven't been uh, holding their hearings, um, we, we find that it's appropriate for Council to authorize an electronic meeting of the entire Committee of Adjustment sitting as Committee of the Whole to meet electronically so that um, in that role, uh, they can um, consider the purposes of considering revisions to its rules of procedure. It allows them to move forward. Okay. Um, on the recommendation, carried. Mayor, Councillor Leeper. Mayor. Sorry, Councillor Leeper. Leeper. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so if I may ask, uh, what about public participation? Um, the rules here would say that they could sit and meet electronically for the purposes of considering revisions to its rules of procedure. Um, is there a way in which we can ensure some public participation in that? So, Mr. Clerk, uh, is that, I'm assuming they, they would have the same technology that we would have available to allow the public to participate, Mr. O'Connor? Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, it's oh, Tim it's Mark. Tim Mark, Mark sorry. Maybe. Yeah, go ahead, Tim. Uh, Mr. Mayor, so yes, they will be taking an approach that would be, uh, we anticipate to be similar to the planning committee uh, that uh, th they are going to be taking with respect to allowing public participation. Uh, but there is, in fact, a uh, provision in the Statutory Powers Procedures Act, which allows a person, if they believe this should be done by an in-person hearing as opposed to an electronic hearing, uh, to register their complaint, uh, and the committee would have to consider whether or not it would be more appropriate to deal with it in an in-person hearing. Okay, that's good to hear. Councillor Leeper, anything else? I, well, I am just wondering if um, the mover would be open to a friendly amendment to make it explicit that uh, it would be sitting as a committee of the whole to meet electronically, including public participation for the purposes. So what, what uh, uh, sentence are you amend, wanting to amend, Councillor Leeper? So in the resolution, therefore be it resolved that the Council of the City of Ottawa authorizes the Committee of Adjustment of the City of Ottawa sitting as a committee of the whole uh, to meet electronically, including uh, with public or on condition of public participation for the purposes of considering revisions, revisions to its rules of procedure. Uh, Tim, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Fleury. Uh, no, just a second. Tim, Mark, could you comment on that? Because I don't quite understand how it would change, because to meet electronically, you are uh, receiving public input. Mr. Mayor, what I understand the Council's motion to be saying is that he's asking that not just that the hearings themselves be open to the public, which is an absolute necessity, but that in considering its revisions to its rules of procedure, the committee accept public submissions, which isn't a statutory requirement. That's what I believe the council is asking. Sorry, to submit, uh, to receive public uh, delegations, but not in person, unless they yes, ask. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Mayor, it would be like on March the 25th, 
Council had accepted public submissions on whether on how it should change its rules of procedure to deal with the emergency. That is what I understand the councillor is asking. Councillor Harder, are you okay with that? As long as it's not illegal and uh, Mr. Mark uh, says that it can be done, I don't have a problem. Okay, so that's a friendly amendment. Okay, uh, so... Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, Councillor Eli Alshantiri. Yes. Can we, is, is that going to have any impact or any delay? Mr. Mark, can he help us with that? Is that a friendly amendment to Mr. Mark to, to, to move forward with it? Yeah, it's, it's a friendly amendment to Councillor Harder. Mr. Mark, just for the benefit of the people listening, and Mr. Tim Mark is on the line. He's uh, one of our senior lawyers. Uh, Mr. Mark, is this going to, uh, first of all, is this uh, legal? And secondly, uh, will it delay any of the proceedings at the Committee of Adjustment, in your opinion? Uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, I might inv invite the Deputy Clerk to make a comment. Is it illegal? No, it is not, Mr. Mayor. Might it require a, a few extra days to uh, get it set up so that the committee can take submissions from the public? Um, uh, the deputy clerk might be able to speak to the, the, the skill set that is required uh, in order to, to accommodate that. But in the end, the committee would have had to do it anyway for the individual panel meetings. Okay. So, deputy clerk, you're in agreement with that? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I understand the Committee of Adjustment will be following the City's lead in terms of what we are doing for the Joint Planning Committee and ARAC meeting scheduled for the second week of May uh, and would be taking public participation following that. Okay, so I think I heard Councillor Fleury. Do you have something to comment on this, Councillor? You don't have to. No, Mr. Mayor, I just uh, was speaking up if he needed a sec seconder for this. Okay. Okay, uh, so uh, on the motion, as amended, well, it's a friendly amendment, so we don't have to say that. Carried. Okay. Adopt A. Any dissents? Okay, thank you. Uh, the next uh, motion requiring suspension of the rules uh, is by Councillor Brockington, seconded by Councillor Egli with respect to allotment gardens. On suspension, carried. Carried. Uh, carried. Any dissents? Councillor Brockington, if you'd like to introduce your motion, please. And I guess Councillor Egli also brought a similar motion to the Health Board as well, I believe. Yes, that's correct, Mr. Mayor. And I won't read the whereas, as I think it's fairly uh, self-explanatory, but I would like to provide a very brief comment. I think we can all agree that community gardens across the city provide multiple benefits to residents and organizations who plant vegetables and herbs and other uh, plants will do this because, frankly, they need to grow their own produce. They, they use it for their own families, provide it to communities and persons in need in communities, and there are a number of uh, community groups that grow food, which they then give to other individuals and groups in need. Uh, this is not about providing people opportunities to, to conduct their hobbies. This is really out of necessity, and I want to thank Chair Egli for his work on the Board of Health. Um, Board of Health passed a motion the other night and appreciate him seconding today's motion. Certainly many groups and individuals in my ward from family houses that grow food for people who live in social housing to people who do not have backyards, the many uh, apartment uh, dwellers in my ward and across the city who do not have the physical capacity to grow food that the community gardens provide this service for. So this can be done by respecting physical distancing, and I hope that the municipalities and other groups that have been contacting the province uh, lately allows that to sink in. I'll just say in Riverward, both MPP Fraser and Hardin have also sent letters to the province supporting uh, this initiative, and I hope members of council support this today. Great, thank you. Uh, just as a happenstance, I um, was speaking with Premier Ford last night, and this was one of the issues I raised with him and uh, explained to him how important these allotment gardens, community gardens, are to different neighborhoods. And uh, he was certainly very um, empathetic uh, about um, our request that we uh, allow the community gardeners to get in there to start planting and weeding and harvesting. Uh, their food products, so uh, hopefully um, 
this motion, which we'll send to him today, will reinforce my conversation with him, but he was very understanding uh, when, when I brought up the issue. So thank you, Councillor Brockington, and thank you, thank Councillor you. Aglai, for uh, bringing May this I forward. May I Sorry, who's that? Uh, Councillor Kavanaugh. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm very, of course, I'm very supportive of this. And I just want to point out the importance because when we talk about uh, our private properties and our own backyards, um, we can do a lot of things. And that's been a problem in terms of having closed parks, et cetera, because people who don't have uh, those private spaces, such as backyards, can't take advantage of parks. Well, it's the same thing with community gardens. There are a lot of people out there that don't have those those public uh, pri private spaces, so they need these public gardens. And uh, and with the growing season coming up, uh, it would be a shame not to be able to have these people grow their own food. Uh, a lot of support in uh, Bayward on this. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, so. Someone is uh, pushing uh, a number of buttons if, on their phone. If they could stop doing that, please. Thank you. Merci. Uh, so on the motion, carried. 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 Any, any dissents? Dissents? No? Okay, thank you. The next uh, motion requiring suspension of the rules procedure is um, pr to provide uh, a private approach to parking. Uh, on suspension, carried. Carried. Uh, Councillor Menard, if you'd like to, oh, sorry, any dissents on that? Councillor Menard, if you'd like to introduce your motion. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, I'll just read the it resolved uh, that in respect of the reconstructing of Fairbairn Street, Belmont Avenue, Willard Street, and Bellwood Avenue, private approaches be reinstated as they were immediately prior to the reconstruction of these streets. It's uh, similar to Councillor Aguilar's uh, motion last meeting, and I personally walked these and worked with staff on um, some of these private approaches. There's not many, and most of them are in the 50s and 60s. So uh, hopefully get council support on this. Thank you. Okay, on the uh, motion, carried. Carried. Any carried. dissents? Carried. No dissents, okay, thank you. The next uh, item requiring suspension of the rules uh, is uh, community shout out in support of healthcare providers and essential workers during COVID-19. Moved by Councillor Kavanaugh, second by Councillor Leeper. On suspension, carried. 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 Any dissents? Oh, Councillor Kavanaugh, if you'd like to introduce your motion, please. Thank you. Uh, lost track if I'm on mute or not mute. My, do you hear me? We can, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for this. Um, this is just an extension of what we've already passed. Uh, we're getting a lot of support for it, and clearly this is going to go on for a long time. And we need to uh, continue to speak out on on how important this is. This is um, this is also important in terms of the socialization it provides, because when people interact with each other and talk about doing a shout out together, it's another opportunity to work together. And we we don't have many opportunities to reach out to our neighbors, and so this is very important. Uh, we need this for our mental health as well. Just a, a feeling that we're doing something and that we're continuing to, to put up, uh, our, our, keeping our spirits up. So uh, thank you very much for your support on this. Here. Great. Thank you very much, Councillor. And uh, all those in favour, carried? Carried. Carried. Any dissents? Carried. Uh, are there any other motions requiring suspension of the rules of procedure? Notice is a motion for consideration of subsequent meeting. I've made motion for examen réunion subséquente. Councillor Cloutier seconded by myself with respect to the selection process for the Auditor General. Councillor Cloutier, if you'd like to introduce, please, your notice of motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Just want to tell members of Council that uh, as Chair of the Audit Committee, I'm giving notice that I'll introduce a motion at the next Council meeting to begin the process to select the successor um, for the Auditor General. The Auditor General was approved, uh, was appointed in December 2013, and his term expires in December 2020. He's done an outstanding job, valuable work of the uh, of auditing work at the City of Ottawa and 
uh, at the end of, uh, and we need to begin the process to uh, to find a successor for that important work. Okay, thank you. So we'll deal with that at our next council meeting. The next uh, notice of motion is uh, by Councillor Menard, seconded by Councillor Leeper, please. Councillor Menard, if you'd like to introduce the motion that will be dealt with at the next council meeting. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mayor. It uh, has to do with um, a change in the Section 37 uh, of the Planning Act uh, funds for a particular property in the ward, um, whereas, uh, I'll go through the reality, whereas, uh, whereas uh, bylaw 2017 was enacted by Council on February 8, 2017, and directed by the owner of the lands at 265 Carlin to enter into an agreement pursuant to Section 37 of the Planning Act, be registered on title to the satisfaction of the city solicitor and general manager planning and construction economic development to secure an amount of 204,581.25 and whereas 100 percent of the required funds were directed to improvements to Eugene Forsey Park and Dalhousie South Park uh, as detailed uh, with part 19 of bylaw 2008-2050 and whereas no further improvements are needed at this time for that park beyond $157,000 presently allocated for park upgrades to this park in the 2020 city budget and where it is estimated that improvements to Eugene Corsi Park can be accommodated within a budget of 100000 and whereas the parties entered into the aforementioned Section 37 agreement um, which was registered on January 10, 2017 but the funds have not yet been paid to the city as development in respect of the property has not commenced and whereas it is at the request and direction of the Ward Council to have 51% of the above funds redirected toward affordable housing within Ward 17, and where it, whereas it is at the request and direction of the Ward Council that the remaining 49% of the funds will be directed to improvements at Eugene Forsey Park, and whereas such, the Section 37 agreement may be amended upon consent and approval of the owner and the city, whereby such approval has been granted by the owner, therefore be it resolved the Council approve an amendment to instrument number OC1859698 provide for the redistribution of the anticipated funds in the following manner, 104,581.25 be directed towards Ward 17 affordable housing and be $100,000 be directed towards Eugene Forsey Park improvements. We have further resolved that such amending agreement be registered on title to the lot to the satisfaction of the city solicitor in consultation with the GM planning infrastructure and economic development. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next uh, notice of motion is by Councillor Leeper. Seconded by Councillor King. Councillor Leeper, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this one with respect to the opening of um, outdoor spaces, the safe active transportation spaces outdoors, uh, that we uh, directed staff to start working on uh, at our council meeting a month or so ago. Uh, I know in my case, uh, I've had a very successful closure to all the local traffic on Byron, uh, but we are going to start hitting um, a uh, hurdle with respect to trying to fund those so long as they are required to be funded entirely from ward councillors' budgets. Uh, I'm looking at trying to work with staff on, on some other creative funding options. Uh, so I'll just leave the, therefore, be it resolved, which is that the direction to fund pandemic-related temporary extensions of active transportation space inclusive of accessing essential services solely through ward councillors' budgets be removed and that councillors may work with staff to identify opportunities for further implementations, including identifying any appropriate funding sources not restricted to their ward budgets. Okay, thank you. Uh, motion to introduce bylaws. Motion portant présentation de règlement. Councillor Moffat, please. Seconded by Councillor Dudas. Thank you very much. That the bylaws listed on the agenda under motion to introduce bylaws three readings be read and passed. Carried. Any dissents? Okay. Uh, confirmation bylaw, uh, règlement de ratification, Councillor Moffat and Dudas, please. That the following bylaw be read and passed to confirm the proceedings of the Council meeting of April 22, 2020. Carried. Adopté. Any dissents? Uh, inquiries, Councillor Moffat, as uh, uh, a notice he'd like to inform members of council and the public on, please, Councillor. Thank you very much. Yes, as uh, many are aware, uh, when we closed our city facilities, the trail road waste facility was also part of that closure. Just wanted to um, 
the public and the members of council will get a notification today that the Trail Road Waste Facility will be reopening tomorrow, Thursday, April 23rd. It'll be open from Monday to Friday from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., except this week we will be open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Saturday will be open from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., but from that point forward, it will be closed on Saturdays uh, just to give it's just a different uh, additional safety measures that are trying to put in place, um, just difficult to operate six days a week. Um, so if people have been to the site, they are where the scale house does have public interaction. So it took some time to implement some safety measures at the facility in order to keep our staff safe that are there uh, day in, day out. Uh, so that's now been done and it's ready to, to be open. So that'll happen, that'll happen tomorrow. Okay, thank you uh, for that. Uh, any other inquiries, Madam Deputy Clerk? Uh, Councillor Moffat, uh, adjournment, please. Second by Councillor Dudas. Thank you again. That the proceedings of the City Council meeting of April 22nd, 2020 be adjourned. Carried. Adopt A. Any dissension? No. Nope. Thank you. Meeting adjourned, and the uh, press availability or media availability will. Uh, commence at uh, 1.30 uh, in the council chamber and also be available on uh, the YouTube channel, I believe, for the city. Thank you. Merci. Ottawa's local shops, restaurants, and services are woven into the fabric of our city. We can all help them during these challenging times. Order from them online, purchase gift certificates to use later, order meals for takeout or delivery, send them messages of support on social media. Please do it today. Learn how at ottawa.ca slash buy local.
Disponible pour des questions des médias, nous accueillons Mayor Le Maire Jim Watson. Phoning in, we have Councillor Keith Eglai, Chair of Ottawa Public Health Board. Conseiller Keith Eglai, Président du Conseil de Santé publique Ottawa. City Manager, Directeur municipal Steve Canalakos. Dr. Dr. Vera Etches, Chief Medical Officer of Health, Médecin Chef en Santé publique. Anthony DiMonte, General Manager of Emergency and Protective Services, Directeur Général des Services de Protection et d'Urgence. Phoning in, we have Donna Gray, General Manager, Community and Social Services Department, Services Sociaux et Communautaires. Phoning in as well, we have Wendy Stevenson, Chief Financial Officer, Chef des Finances. As well, phoning in, we have Chief Peter Slowly, Ottawa Police Service, Chef Peter Slowly, du Service de Police d'Ottawa. And as well, phoning in, we have Dean Lett, Director of Long-Term Care, Directeur des Soins de Longue Durée. I will quickly do a roll call to see which agencies are on the line. If I have missed anyone, please let me know. Je vais maintenant confirmer les noms des médias qui sont en attente. 104.7, Outaouais. 104.7, Outaouais. Jason White. Here. Thank you, Jason. CBC, Joanne Chianello. Here. Hi, Joanne. CTV, Josh Pringle. Here. Le Droit. Le Droit, Julien Paquette. Here. Fred Sherwin. Ottawa Citizen, John Willing. Hi, Kina. Hi. Ottawa Sun, Elizabeth Payne. Yep. Thank you. Radio Canada, Gilles Taillon. Radio Canada, Gilles Taillon. Radio Canada, Gilles Taillon. Are you on the line? Yes, I am. TVA Gatineau, Ottawa, Etienne Malouin. Is Etienne Malouin on the line? Guccioni? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Nous allons maintenant répondre aux questions. We'll now answer questions from the media. You'll have one question and one follow-up. Media can ask one question and one follow-up. We'll begin uh, A to Z for today, and uh, next time we'll do Z to A. Uh, we'll start with 1310 News. Jason White. Hi there. Uh, my question is regarding the preparation uh, for uh, once all of these restrictions start to be lifted. Um, I believe, uh, Mr. Kanlak, as you referred to, so as it uh, being so that the city isn't caught by surprise uh, once the federal government and provincial government start lifting restrictions. Can you detail a little bit more uh, what needs to be done from the city's perspective to prepare for reopening the economy? Uh, what does that involve and what does that look like from your end? What sorts of things are you doing uh, to prepare for down the line when these restrictions are lifted? Steve and I are collaborating very carefully uh, on making sure that the priority is the safety of the population. And so um, I'll just start uh, and, and he'll uh, address the city specifically. Uh, we know that this is an area where federal and provincial uh, guidance will be uh, critical and we'll follow that uh, with um, some decisions to be made at the local level. And what we are also very conscious of is that we need to have everything in place place uh, that enables us to proceed safely. So signs that the infection is declining in our community, uh, evidence that our health care system is ready to cope, including uh, you know, the protection of our vulnerable long-term care home and retirement home populations. Uh, we need to have a surveillance system to be able to monitor how much infection is in our community and a testing and contact management, uh, case and contact management program to follow up in, in a very targeted way to make sure we stop transmission in our community. So these kinds of criteria that we need to have in place is, you know, that's what we're working on. And then, um, you know, following along with the province, uh, the guidance around uh, increasing activities that will bring a risk uh, as we open up uh, different activities, a risk of transmission of the virus in our community again. Most of the population is not immune to this virus, and so we need to proceed carefully. 
Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Etches. And uh, what I would add to that is that there are many uh, things that, um, that we do that are enablers to economic activity. And one of the things I'll give an example is childcare. And uh, that's, an, that's something that the province and the federal government is very interested in because a lot of people can't uh, reintegrate back into their jobs and into the economy if they don't have proper childcare. Ultimately, schools will be a big factor in that. Um, in our end, uh, transit is going to be a big issue in terms of uh, people getting back on buses, back on trains, uh, how do they social distance. So we have to start thinking as we anticipate what sectors are going to open up uh, in what order as the, as the provincial government announces those things. We have to anticipate our services and what things do we have to do to protect our staff. Uh, whether it's personal protective equipment or, or the signage or the rules or the, 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 uh, the, the thing that it, communication we put out to the public. And how is the public uh, going to have confidence so they can enter into some of these systems and services and be safe? And so we're starting to think about all those things. And uh, the, the easiest example I'll give is what the grocery stores have started doing uh, because they were allowed to stay open. You know, the, the tape in the floor, keeping people separate, uh, the plexiglass between cashiers and customers, uh, people going around to make sure that people stay uh, separate, the unidirectional movement through the stores. We've been talking about all those things for our facilities, for our services. Um, and then on top of that, we have a a function to uh, regulate, to inspect, to give permits. Uh, many industries require city inspections, uh, require uh, the city to uh, uh, to sign off on their work and their permits, etc. Particularly in in, uh, in uh, Mr. Willis's uh, uh, department. Uh, so, how do we get those people back out into the field uh, to make sure that many of our infrastructure projects, private sector, public sector, are still operating? Um, so, we are working our way through um, all the various scenarios and what the prerequisites are, so that we either have supply chain nailed down in terms of personal protective equipment or signage ready or buildings fit up that are ready and the tape on the ground that's ready. So we start doing all those things so that we don't get caught short. The announcement comes and we can't participate because we haven't done the thinking and we have to do it post the announcement. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up, Jason? Uh, I do. Uh, on the economic uh, side of things as it pertains to the city's finances, um, I, I've been monitoring the, the meeting through the day, but obviously we're all doing two and three jobs right now. Can you talk a bit more about the financial effects and how far out you expect this to ripple time-wise? Like how long uh, is the city expecting that this pandemic will affect the city's finances? Um, how far into the future? Are we talking a few months? Are we talking the rest of this year? Uh, how much of an effect is this going to have on 2021? Uh, do you expect at this point? Yes, we've, uh, our city treasurer laid out uh, three scenarios we're working from. The first one is to the end of June. Um, the second one is into uh, September, and the third one is to the end of the year. Uh, right now, the most likely scenario we're working under is till the end of September before we start seeing things uh, ramp back up. Um, that's because we also anticipate, you know, with summer coming, uh, a lot of people won't be here, and it's usually a quieter time in Ottawa anyways. Um, and so we're thinking that our revenues will be affected until um, um, uh, the end of September. Um, but the impact will carry into uh, 2021. There's no question about about that. Um, council will have to make some decisions uh, with the mayor's leadership in terms of uh, in terms of what is our fiscal framework going to be, our long-range plan going forward into 2021 with respect to property taxes, with respect to increase to fees, with respect to inflationary increases in, in terms of our costs, uh, in terms of projects we have going. We are going to have to look at all those things because if the revenue um, uh, shortfall carries into um, the end of the year, even at the third quarter, we're going to have to make adjustments into 2021. So we're looking at this as a, uh, a problem through the next uh, 18 months um, that we're going to have to manage as an organization um, to make sure that we balance our revenues and our expenditures. Thank, thank, you. thank you. We'll now move on to Joanne Chianello at CBC. Hi, thanks. Uh, this is a, a question. My first question is, I, I guess, for Dr. Etches, but anyone else as well. Um, the province, uh, as you said, they told you last night, but they announced this morning that uh, they want um, COVID testing in all long-term care facilities um, in Ottawa. And I'm wondering if you can address whether um, the health care system has the capacity 
to do that. The people, the supplies, even the lab testing capacity, you know, it's saying it seems like there's a lot of uh, people we want to test suddenly. So if you could address that, Dr. Etches, thank you. Yes, uh, so we are going to follow the provincial direction locally in Ottawa to make sure that uh, the surveillance testing that they're interested in is carried out. Uh, it will require a coordinated approach uh, with our health care system partners or the long-term care homes themselves, uh, but it is a joint effort. Uh, it will require people to take the swabs. Uh, it will require a coordinated approach at the labs so that we don't overwhelm the capacity of the labs uh, such that th those important tests that need to get through you know for healthcare workers for people in hospital that those can still be processed uh, and so this is what we're looking at today uh, is how uh, we can plan this in a way that allows it to move ahead as effectively and as efficiently as possible thank you do you have a follow-up Joanne yeah I do actually I with the Premier last night. Um, can you just, uh, what can you tell us about the conversations he had and the kind of feedback you're getting from him? Thank you. Yeah, we, um, uh, we talked about, um, he wanted my advice and, and comment on, um, you know, when we should start opening up segments of the economy because obviously uh, uh, he, like I, um, are feeling the, the, the concerns and listening to the concerns of a number of uh, businesses that uh, are obviously uh, starving and, and uh, uh, doing not so well financially. And uh, we talked about, you know, the, the key element really is to make sure that we don't rush into opening the economy or segments of the economy too soon. And then we're hit with a second wave of uh, COVID-19 and then we have to backtrack and start closing those businesses again and laying people off. So I think both he and I are of the same opinion that we should be doing this um, uh, very cautiously and it should be staggered and staged so it's not all at once, so it doesn't overwhelm other public services like transit and daycare and so on. And I also asked him about a couple specific issues, as I mentioned at Council today, with respect to allotment gardens and the importance of allotment gardens, particularly uh, to economically challenged neighbourhoods. And as I said uh, earlier today, he was quite sympathetic to the fact that uh, if we can you know, manage uh, opening up the gardens uh, from a physical distance point of view and a safety point of view, then obviously he would uh, certainly look at that and he, he committed to bringing that back to uh, his cabinet table. So I thought it was a, a good, uh, good exchange and, um, and I think we're both on the same page with respect to we want to see the economy open but we don't want to uh, rush into it and get ourselves into a, a bigger um, challenge when we end up having to reclose re uh, businesses and relay off people, which I think would be uh, pretty uh, horrific uh, for the spirit of uh, the individuals in the, the greater community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll now move on to Josh Pringle at CTV. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, CTV has heard that parks and recreation staff have been asked to help PSWs at the city-owned nursing homes. Can you confirm that this is happening? And if so, what are city staff doing to help out in these homes during the pandemic? Yeah, maybe I'll ask, um, you know, I, I can answer, but I think uh, Donna Gray is up to speed in terms of the latest uh, redeployment uh, strategy that we're, that we're undertaking for the long-term care. Is Donna, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, yes, so we we have, as part of our city redeployment plan, been looking at most urgent redeployments, and obviously our long-term care um, homes, for a variety of reasons, are areas that we want to ensure actually are, are staffed and have support to do the essential work that those groups need to do. And one of the areas the team identified first off is um, two areas actually. The first was that we're recognizing that the seniors um, in our long-term care, that their physical and their mental health, in order for them to stay healthy, they need to be connected to families and loved ones and friends. And we recognize that that has been an increasing stress on those individuals in the homes and the families themselves. So we do have a, a position in the long-term care homes that is 
making direct contact between residents and their and their families for a variety of things, whether that be emails or um, through Skyping or electronic devices so that people can stay connected to their families. And so Parks and Recreation, um, they have a group of staff who, uh, because of the programming right now, are not currently uh, working in the centres. So we did a call out for volunteers of people who would be willing and interested in working in the long-term care. So we currently have about 20 positions um, that will be staggered um, over um, the homes to come in and to be able to provide those supports. And additionally, we're also looking at um, those functions potentially doing some feeding of individuals or moving individuals um, from room to room um, to be able to assist with some of our professional staffing. Thank you, Donna. Um, so just to follow up. Go ahead, just Josh. Follow up, are, they helping, are they helping now with the feeding and moving individuals or is that something that you're looking at further down the road right now, just sort of going in to help and provide support and that's the next step? Yes, right now they're just, they've been identified and they're just in the process of training and coming into, uh, there's a significant amount of just training and readiness to bring them into that facility, but um, they would be doing uh, both functions. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Josh. Maintenant, on ira à Julien Paquette. Julien Paquette from Le Droit. Yes. I think that Mr. Canes Kananakis in English mentioned the need for the board to take decisions in the coming months to deal with the financial impact of the current pandemic. He also mentioned the possibility of increasing property taxes two weeks ago. Uh, this was uh, something that he said that was perhaps uh, possible. Mr. Mayor, could you perhaps uh, comment on that? Is it uh, still a priority for you to avoid uh, a tax hike because of this pandemic? Answer, well, that is a priority for me. Now, today, there are many members of the Council who express their concerns about uh, possible tax hikes. So there are many people who've lost their jobs in Ottawa. So what we need to do now is to really help them deal with their situation. We don't really have a number yet. Uh, the process will be kicked off over the next few months when we start uh, looking at the budget and drafting the budget. But it's quite possible that we not start uh, drafting the budget in September, October, but that it be delayed uh, because uh, we might not have all the information we need. We won't have uh, information on possible subsidies from the various other levels of government. We're in a situation of flux uh, for the time at uh, this uh, current time, but it's important for me to really keep a handle, keep a, uh, taxes and expenses under control. Mm, the follow-up question for you, Mr. Mayor. You've decided to delay the decision of replacing uh, the Cumberland Award uh, Councillor. Does that mean that the Council will actually want to hold a by-election? Well, it's a very tough situation we're in. It's a unique situation in the history, history of uh, the province of Ontario. I don't think it's a good idea to hold a by-election right now. It's not a good. Uh, it's not a good idea for candidates uh, to uh, uh, to hold uh, public meetings and to be doing door-to-door -door canvassing. So the the uh, clerk suggested today that we defer our decision. We will take that decision probably. In the next uh, couple of months, we'll have to see how the pandemic uh, evolves, and I think that the Council will want to make a decision uh, at a later date. Will we hold a by-election? Well, if the health situation is uh, right, is good, it would be my preference to hold a by-election. But uh, if the situation has not evolved, if we're still in the same situation we're in today, well, I don't think it would be a very a very smart idea to really hold a by-election during a pandemic. 
Now, the other option we have also is uh, to interview candidates, and then the council could choose uh, the winner. But uh, for me, the priority would be to hold a by-election at some point. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's uh, necessary for us to understand uh, that uh, now, during this uh, crisis and during the budget development uh, phase uh, in October, September, October, uh, the residents of Cumberland don't have a voice. Uh, so this is another uh, thing that will uh, come into our decision, which will factor into our decision of whether to hold a by-election or not. The reason we actually adopted or passed that resolution today, moved by Councillor Luloff and uh, seconded by M Councillor De Rose. Well, it's because it gives us more time to actually clarify the situation over the coming months. Thank you. Merci, Julien. Could you please give those answers in English? Would you mind? Thank you. Yeah, it's a, a very unique situation, uh, Joanne, that we find ourselves in with the by-election. Uh, obviously, on the one hand, uh, we want to make sure that the people of Cumberland have a voice around the council table particularly during this pandemic and as we head into the budget process over the course of the next uh, couple of months. Uh, but at the same time, it would be irresponsible for us to hold a by-election in the middle of a pandemic. Obviously, no one wants candidates going door to door and you couldn't have any gathering of a rally or an all-candidates meeting. So the motion today was really to give us a little bit more uh, flexibility uh, to determine uh, the lay of the land in a couple of months and if, we're, if the pandemic is behind us and the Medical Officer of Health uh, gives us the, uh, the, the go signal that we can actually go out and have a by-election, then obviously we would uh, hold that as quickly as possible. Um, if we find ourselves in the same situation in September and October and we're still in the midst of this pandemic, which I, I hope we're not, but if we are, uh, we'll have to make a decision of whether to prolong that uh, by-election or to appoint someone uh, through a nomination process similar to what's been done in the past, for instance, at school boards. My preference, obviously, first and foremost, is to allow the people of Cumberland to select their own person uh, as uh, their councillor. But at some point, um, you know, we have to make a decision that do we continue to keep that seat uh, open without a voice at the table and wait month after month until we get the all clear signal that the pandemic is over and people are free to go door to door and campaign like they would in a normal election. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to Fred Sherwin at Orleans Star. Are you there, Fred Sherwin, Orleans Star? Okay, so we'll move on to John Willing at the Ottawa Citizen. I have a question for either Mayor Watson or Steve Kanalakis. Have you heard anything more about whether construction timelines of stage two have been uh, shifted or altered in any way at this point? No, I think uh, I think John had uh, spoken about that, Manconi, about that before. They um, they have um, obviously are concerned about their timelines, you know, supply chains and the rest, and their productivity uh, isn't um, exactly where they want it to be. But it is a four-year um, schedule plus. Um, they think they can make that up depending how long this goes. So we don't have anything right now from them formal saying that uh, they want us to adjust the timelines or declaring anything uh, under the contract uh, looking for relief. Um, but they have signaled to us that it's a watch item for them. And uh, Mike Morgan, uh, who's our director of rail um, uh, infrastructure, is uh, out there checking. And he says work is still progressing. Um, on all the lines, and they're still moving ahead. So um, we have not, uh, we're not in a position right now to um, uh, to make to come to a conclusion about whether they'll be impacted. Like all these things, it depends how long um, this goes and and uh, how the economy starts opening up. Thank you, John. Do you have a follow up? Yeah, just a related question. That Steve, has there been any indication by a uh fixed price contract holders uh, that they will be seeking more funds from the city for the work under uh, like any contract divisions that might speak to force majeure incidents and, and I'm wondering if the city does consider the, the pandemic a force majeure incident. Are you referring John to uh, light rail or infrastructure projects in general? Uh, 
certainly Steve light rail, but I, I, any infrastructure projects in general too. No, we've you know we've talked to our, our lawyers in terms of whether someone can uh, can um, uh, you know request or, or claim a force majeure, but um, we have not had that. Uh, we have not been formally advised by any of our contractors that that in fact is uh, what they're uh, planning to uh, notify us of. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move to Elizabeth Payne at Ottawa Sun. Hi, thanks. It's uh, a question for Dr. Etches, um, again, on testing. Do you know approximately how many or what percentage of long-term care residents and staff of Ottawa have been tested at this point? Thank you. The, the testing uh, to date has been related to uh, detecting outbreaks and, and controlling outbreaks. And so uh, if there was one healthcare worker uh, that was positive or one resident that was positive in a home, then we would test all of the healthcare workers related to that outbreak. And we would uh, test the residents in the home that were uh, symptomatic, all of the symptomatic ones, as well as anybody who was asymptomatic in close contact with that resident. Uh, so I don't have all of the, the count of the negative test results, uh, but we do have the test results of those who've been positive in those settings. Um, so I believe so far uh, among the outbreak situations, we have 247 lab confirmed cases among Ottawa residents. Um, and, and staff and 20, uh, well, 21 associated deaths within the long-term care homes or retirement homes. So that um, is just the positives. The, the team would have more information on that if you'd like all of the, the tests that have been done. We are trying to, um, uh, of course, add up everything and make sure uh, we have a list of everybody uh, who needs to be tested, and that's part of the planning and the coordination going forward so that we uh, do complete the exercise. Uh. Okay, and just to follow, follow to that, the, um, uh, that is uh, a small proportion, is that correct, of, of everybody you would now have to test? Do you have any sense of what you're looking at? Have you done 20% of everyone, 10% uh, less? Yes, I, I, I can't say right now. I don't have those numbers, but that is uh, you know, part of what we need to map out. Uh, certainly, it is a, a much larger number that we um, are going to, to be following the ministry guidance. Uh, it, it looks like we're waiting for details uh, on that and, and how the province would like us to, to roll that out. Um, but we will be building on uh, what has been done around outbreak uh, detection and control. Uh, this work uh, that the province is discussing is more like a surveillance program. Um, and we'll be continuing, uh, of course, uh, the work around outbreak control as well. Thank you very much. Uh, maintenant, nous irons à Gilles Taillon, Radio-Canada. Gilles Taillon, Radio-Canada. Hello, my first question is for Dr. Etches. The city seems to be looking at a return to normalcy, a normal, normal uh, municipal operation starting in September. Do you think this is realistic? Do you think it's plausible? And what are the conditions that have to be met for you to, to reopen in September? It's not my decision alone. It's not my decision to actually lift uh, the current restrictions designed to control the uh, transmission of the virus. So it's really the province uh, that will set out uh, the guidelines. But for me, it's important that the province uh, develop a process uh, to protect uh, Ontarians' health uh, especially those who are the most vulnerable among us. So there must be measures in place, such as the right resource level in the healthcare, 
uh, system. There also has to be a surveillance uh, system so we can really get a handle on infection in our community. There has to be a contact uh, follow-up system as well that's put in place. But what's just as important is the buy-in from the community. There has to be a process which is clear and easily understandable by the community. What are the priorities? Those have to be made clear to ordinary people. So if anybody else from the city has any other comments, uh, I would ask them to step in. But I can't say definitively that we will be opening up again in, in September. I, have, I hope I have answered your question. Well, Gilles, what uh, the city manager has said is that we're looking at various scenario, uh, scenario for June, scenario for September, and a scenario for the end of December. Now, what he also said is that we have uh, work groups, a task force, task forces that have been set up uh, to actually reopen the city based uh, on the green light from the province and from the federal government. Uh, as to opening up a specific sectors uh, within the city. Now, the city has to be ready. We have to be ready in terms of public transit uh, at other levels so that we don't, we're not behind the eight ball. These are the preparations that we're doing. We don't know yet when we'll open. We don't know if we'll be able to open in September, but we'll have to follow the advice from Dr. Etches. As she said, we have to make sure that hospitals are ready. How are we seeing a decrease in the number of cases? There are several things that are being analyzed. So this is what we're doing. We're analyzing to see whether we're ready for September. And if we are, we'll take the steps to we need to put in place really to open up. But it really depends on the decisions made by higher levels of government. My follow-up question is for the mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, hello. We've learned uh, that the city is spending $24 million uh, a day, and a deficit uh, is uh, predicted. Uh, given that uh, a lot of uh, the city's budget really is taken up by workers' salaries, uh, are you looking at that? Are you looking at possible reductions? Well, all options are on the table. I think it's the responsible thing to do. But for the time being, we have the capacity to deal with the situation. Because we had a contingency fund, we had, a, we had reserves. We've laid off 4,200 people a week ago. That was a tough decision, but it was necessary. The third thing is that we have placed a freeze on uh, new hiring for the next few weeks and months. At the same time, we're working with the other two levels of government. because we must be able to reach out to them to get uh, financial support uh, for projects such as uh, major infrastructure projects, uh, uh, transport projects. And Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Ford's governments have been very, very positive. We haven't yet reached an agreement. That's half of the solution, at least, for all municipalities. Subsidies from the two other levels of government are important. At the same time, we are looking at cuts here at the city as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Etienne Malouin from TVA, are you on the line? No. Last but not least. Yeah, my question is for the city manager. Um, Steve, I wonder if you could expand a bit on what Steve Willis is working on, what his work. I think you mentioned at the last council meeting and, and again today that he's looking at all the infrastructure projects and uh, and some may fall off the list. Is that Did I hear that correctly? 
Well, Steve's um, Steve's looking more. We've got two uh, the four task forces. One of them's on services, which is Dan Shenny, who's looking inward, Pat, to our own services and how do we get up and running. Um, and then Steve's looking out. And I'll give you an example. We were on a call um, the other day with um, um, senior federal public servants. And we were discussing, you know, how can we work together to ensure that, for instance, we don't have uh, peak rush hours for our transit system? And is there a possibility to look at, you know, staggering work shifts, at least in the short term, until we get back on our feet uh, so we don't overwhelm the system? So Steve Willis's role is to, um, is to continue those discussions, um, is to look at all the things in the city that we provide as services that the private sector needs for them to be operational. And the obvious ones, as I mentioned, were construction and inspections and permits and road cuts and all those big infrastructure pieces is, is just one, one, uh, one piece of it that, that we do. Um, and so, and Steve is also looking at from a, from a, uh, the big project priorities uh, for the city. We just, uh, uh, passed a council just passed a strategic plan uh, when we passed the budget and um, and in that strategic plan are a list of priorities that council expects us to move on and some of them are big policy decisions we're still moving forward on the official plan for instance but the transportation master plan which is a big piece of work and is critical for our our future um, is really dependent on data on people's travel patterns and I don't think our, our consultants can do the study that we need to input into making uh, developing strategies and thinking through what our transportation needs are going to be in the future when we have a an anomaly an aberration uh, right now in the system so Steve's looking at our entire legislative agenda all our big uh, projects that we have on our capital projects that we have underway, uh, which ones are going to be affected by by our um, uh, by our uh, vendors not being able to uh, to deliver on the work in the time frame that we have, which ones have to be put out uh, put out later, which ones haven't tendered yet, maybe we want to wait because uh, we want to preserve our capital funding for something else. Uh, what's the federal government, provincial government, going to do? As the mayor said, in terms of supporting us um, with uh, with infrastructure dollars. So Steve is trying to figure out how are we best positioned um, to support uh, the business community and private sector, and he's also trying to figure out what do we have to do internally to make sure that we have the capacity to be able to do that, uh, provide that support. Thank you. Uh, do you have a follow-up, Pat? Uh, my follow-up question is for Dr. Etches, and it's really um, sort of following up on what Elizabeth Payne was asking. Um, I think you mentioned at the council meeting today that if there's not an outbreak at a, at a senior's residence or a long-term care center, that you're not testing all, all residents. Did I, did I hear that correctly today? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, that, that has been the case, that when there's not an outbreak, Break declared. Uh, the focus is on detecting the outbreak, uh, so looking for people who have symptoms of illness, whether they're residents or uh, staff, you know, people with atypical symptoms. Uh, what is shifting uh, is based on provincial guidance uh, that came down uh, last night, early this morning, uh, and that will uh, change the approach to testing uh, where there is not an outbreak. Uh, it, it'll be a surveillance exercise, and we're waiting um, to have more details on on how the province would like us to undertake that. And we're starting to coordinate a plan locally with our healthcare partners uh, to be able to have the capacity to undertake this as effectively, as efficiently as we can. Thank you very much, everyone. Merci à tout le monde. This is all the time that we have. C'est tout le temps que nous disposons aujourd'hui. Have a great day. Bonne journée.